So we're we'll trying to lose rotate to get this complete. Okay, so it seems like it's all set. Yes, yeah. we're good. We're live. I'm going to transfer host back to Rasa and um, I will get this link over to Kelsey so that she can post it. There you go. Y'all are good to go. I'm going to leave the meeting and good luck with everything. Hello. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Hi. I'm sorry for. Hello. <laughs> we have some technical setups, so we have actually a specific camera installed and uh, to make it a live stream, and we are using university equipment, so it's really nice uh, start and today. Uh, yes, uh, we would like to start our presentation. Welcome, everyone. I would like to introduce our guests coming from abroad and <laughs> from far away. Yes, we have today Konak Wan Trakulicharon joining us from Bangkok, an architect and historian and a researcher being, uh, working on consultancy for building materials and soundscapes. And Konak Wan has got her doctoral dissertation at the uh, Rome for the Vergata. And she has also worked as a, a postdoctoral position as well in Rome and as well in Innsbruck University by Professor Bartoszma within the research to the architectural learning and complex system. And I'm very happy to welcome Konak Wang 
She is also collaborating with architects and publishing the book recently with a landscape architect. So it's really, we are very happy to have you here with those multiple knowledges joining our final presentation. We have Imre Andrasaite joining us from Vienna, assistant professor and researcher at the Institute of Architecture and Landscape, Graz University of Technology. As well, Indra has a very various background from the artistic one to the practice and working on competitions and also realizations. Indra as well has a collaboration with Venice Biennale, Lithuanians uh, um, from the Lithuania side. We are really happy, Indra, to have you here with us multiple backgrounds. And uh, as well, I have to mention that Indra has worked as an assistant professor at the Angevante with the uh, studio Sajima, um, which is also we are so great with your knowledge and this extensive skills uh, to get comments from you to our final presentation. We also have uh, our lecturer from UT joining us, Kevin Sorova. Welcome. It's a designer specialized in three-dimensional spatial modeling. And uh, Kevin as well is working uh, with now an Austin-based architecture uh, firm, landscape architecture firm. So where his projects is ranging in scale of small parts and urban landscapes. So we are very happy to have you Kevin here. And we have Daniel Kohler, assistant professor, from joining from UT, is an architect, urban, urbanist, and researcher, and at the moment uh, is working on design of, design of distributed technologies at the urban scale. Welcome, Daniel. We are very happy to have you, and of course, with neurologies and city architecture, urban forms, theories. <laughs> so, we are very happy to have such a nice interview in our first panel. Yes, and the last but not least, I would like also to introduce our studio brief shortly. Please let me share my screen. One second. So our advanced design studio in this fall semester is called Planting Urban Cycles. No. Share the screen. What you can share? Can everyone can they see the screen? Maybe just double check. I think they should be. Excuse me, can you see the screen? Is there maybe some feedback? Um, not so well. We see you, Rasa, camera pointing to you. That's not the screen. Just one second. So I was. Yeah, I did it. On this one specifically. Thank you. Maybe now. <laughs> Is it successful? Now it's successful. Yeah. Great, thank you for coming back. Yes, so our design studio in this fall is working with planting urban cycles for new models of cohabitation for Austin. We see uh, a huge need to approach, to approach our, To approach our actually the main issue meeting the Paris Agreement and to work with us in the context of Austin, where the at the moment we would very much would like to experiment within the architecture and search for the ways and solutions to reduce average per person emission in Austin, which is eight times less than Austin current, current level. We work and highly interested what kind of ways could 
not only other fields, but the architecture could produce, could be useful, could be uh, for us as an inspiration for, for the design of our logic to have these entities embedded in the as an urban hubs. Density and diversity we see as our main issues. The interactions for us is like between different, uh, the interaction between different communities and living under one of uh, one common place, share the resources and have multiple layers embedded in a different uh, uh, aspect. As we have looked at the plant in Chicago, in several references, you can see that the cycle, the meaning of the cycle here is set up for programmatic, um, innovative ideas, how local businesses and the local communities such as brewery, uh, gardening, chicken farms, outdoor farms, and other types of the resources, they are using each other resources in order to be connected so that diversity of the lifestyles are meeting in one building. As you can see in some images of our research, look at the various, various ideas from the existing models in Chicago. The farm Ogden, the second references will look as well, impacts like new job opportunities within the community. The cycling of the water is included through different food production, locally produced food, lower price, good quality of food. At the same time, communal activities such as cooking together, learning to grow outdoor indoor, farming uh, ideas, and all other issues. We also highly look at the post effect post-corona effect in Singapore, where high demand for a large amount of people, residents, uh, high demands for having at once a, a huge amount of uh, food production was installed on the parking garage roofs in a large scale at the same time could be part of cooling system, such as temperature reduction inside. So we saw these old models within the references for us as inspiration to create the cycles, densification, clustering ethics. We see these functional and resourceful communities as a resilience opportunity. In our project, um, during the semester, we had three steps, analysis in a group work. We had research by design, uh, experimentation where diverse special, uh, special cycles could be created. So we see interaction for us as a kind of a method where additional in between spaces beyond the housing, outside the housing, meeting places, communal areas, gatherings for nature, for humans, for gardens, for machines and animals could appear. In the third part, we looked uh, in a situation in the context of Austin. Um, Austin is planning in the future to have more train lines. So every student have chosen a certain spot, a train station. And we see those these areas close to the train station as a huge opportunity for the development of those cycles. Uh, we are planting those buildings as a design uh, devices to plant new cycles in, for Austin. So I would like to invite students and welcome them as well um, to, to start sharing the presentation. The presentations and uh, welcome our students and deny maybe you would like to share your first project. We have four projects in the first uh, session and deny I welcome you to start to share your cycle. Can you just see my screen? 
You guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm Danae, and this is my project. It's the Aerophonic Oasis. So when kind of thinking about this project in these urban cycles, I knew a few features that I wanted to include, including um, this interaction with greenery that's in the school in Vietnam. They have um, a really close connection with the indoor and the outdoor natural environment um, that I really want to implement in my project. Um, and following with that theme of <coughs> this interaction between greenery, this aerophonic garden in O'Hare um, supplies food for the restaurants in the airport and also um, is just a nice space to walk around and look at while you're in this pretty industrial type building. And then the third precedent is this art installation in a botanical garden in Switzerland that um, uses this mist to kind of redefine what the space is and create these implied spaces um, in addition to the plants that are already there. So it kind of redesigns the park. And the last person that I looked at was the Hackney City Farm in London and that, um, like the first project, also brings nature into the more built environment, um, but it's animals instead of plants. And that was also a feature that I wanted to include in my project. So these four kind of features, the interaction with the natural world, both greenery and agriculture slash animals, um, these redefining of these spaces and creating niche spaces and implied spaces and the use of the aeroponic gardens as a more flexible way of gardening were the driving forces of my project. And so for the formal logic, um, like I said before, I was interested in these implied spaces and I wanted to use these two systems to create them. So I chose Poche and Gallery. So with Poche, you get these bigger um, volumetric pieces that both are space in themselves and also create space when you move them. And then with Gallery, you have these thinner pieces that um, define space by connecting with each other and kind of creating this implied boundary. And so when I put those two systems together, this was an initial configuration that I came up with. And you can see these niche spaces that are created um, from the thinner pieces meeting the more volumetric pieces and also the pathways that are created from that. And then this is another configuration of that animation that I showed that I also really liked and just how it kind of clusters together and creates a more built space. And then within the poche, I didn't want it to be this monolithic um, kind of unit. I wanted it to also have voids within it. Um, so in this animation, you can see as the individual units start to shift, um, you have these uh, void spaces that are created that provides additional spaces. And it also um, brings light into the building and also connects these units together and gives them like a community space to join in. And so that's how I designed the um, housing that I'll show in a second. And then this is a configuration of it. Again, the void spaces create kind of both private and public areas to gather. And then in terms of program, so this is also inspired by the school in the sense that bringing students to greenery helps them learn better and gives them the opportunity to learn about how plants grow and how animals operate um, and things like that. So I knew I wanted to include a school in my project. And then also like the project in O'Hare, um, I wanted to include this aerophonic garden and also use it to sustain these bakeries and restaurants in there. Um, and then also including animals and greenery, like I mentioned before, in terms of animals, I'm including uh, goats, sheep, and pigs, and then also chickens. And so for my site, I chose a site at the end of the orange line um, in the slaughter station. It's gonna become a transit center. And um, I thought it would be a good place for the site because it's not within downtown Austin, but it is 
kind of a newer development of Austin. Um, and it's still pretty close to the main part of downtown. And so this kind of box in red is my actual site. And this area surrounding it is actually being developed. Um, like this HEB, for example, was built in the past couple of years. Um, and some of these other businesses are also pretty new. And so I thought it'd be a great place for my site. Um, one kind of constraint of the site are these two roads. So this is South Congress here and then I-35 here. Um, they both create a lot of noise and also bring in a lot of traffic, which um, is good for the site in the sense that a lot of people will see it, but it's bad in the sense that it will be very loud. So I had to come, to, um, come up with a way to kind of mitigate that. Um, without making the project too closed in. So I decided to build up the sides of the site and create these kind of pocket parks that you can inhabit, as well as protect against sound and wind and things like that um, without sacrificing the openness of the community. And then this here is the kind of model of what I imagine the um, light rail would look like. And so it would likely pass right by my site. So I wanted to build up that side more so that the noise from that isn't too um, disruptive. And so here's my project. Um, so like I mentioned, the site is built up to pre prevent um, too much noise. And then I also situated the parks, including the farm park that holds the animals and then the chicken park that holds the chickens. Um, I included those in the back so that they're more protected from sound and also more protected from the crowds that would be um, towards this edge at the HEB. I didn't want those, um, I didn't want that to create an like unhealthy environment for the animals. And then also along these main axes through the center of my project and this axis going across the front. I have located the majority of the bakeries and restaurants so that they're really accessible to the public. And then, so going into the environmental benefits of my um, project, since that was a, a, a large part of how I designed it, um, the trees that are throughout the site help reduce CO2 and also noise and provide shading, as well as these um, green walls that are throughout the project. They um, help shade the outdoor spaces and reduce CO2. And they also just aesthetically tie the entire project together as every single piece of it has some of these. So closer look at the housing. So like I mentioned with the um, Poche animation, I wanted to create communal spaces from the voids that would happen when you would shift the Poche out. And so like spaces like here, I imagine people could gather and have dining spaces or play a game or something like that. Um, and it just provides more interaction between these units in the apartments. And then also um, each housing cluster is connected via these kind of bridges that go across from one to another. And they're also lined with the green wall shading elements um, so that they're a comfortable place to be as well. And then in this render, you can see the effect of these green walls um, in a better detail. So you can see how it's a lush environment and you don't feel like you're in a city, even though you are, um, you're surrounded by leaves and um, nature while also being in a built environment that's pretty densely populated. And then this diagram is showing the kind of differences between the public and private spaces. So I wanted the bottom floor, since it's the easiest to access, to be the most public areas. So you have the restaurants and the bakeries um, here, and then the farm park and the chicken park uh, and the air funded garden in the back that are all completely open to the public. And the school, so I was, I, I wanted to create a space that is a cycle and does function pretty easily within itself, um, but also each individual piece of the cycle can function on its own. So the school is semi-public uh, so that there's not so many people disrupting the learning and the education that's going on in there. 
And then the bridges that connect the housing, as well as these rooftop spaces on the top of the housing are all semi-private because I imagine that mostly residents would be using them, but they are accessible to the public. And then the housing, of course, is completely private, as well as the areas immediately surrounding the animal barns so that they aren't disrupted. And then this section shows kind of the levels of interaction within this cycle. So you can see that there are people going about their lives in their apartments, as well as people walking outside along the bridges, um, people running, and um, the school is operating and functioning. And the uh, farm park towards the side is also operating and the animals are um, in their own space, as well as the humans are kind of observing them around. And so to talk more about the school, I placed it in the center of the community because I wanted it to be really connected to the rest of it. Um, so you can see there's easy pathways from it to the farm park, to the chicken coops, to the air funded gardens, so that the students can go there and learn about those different things and see them with their own eyes. Um, but the, I also wanted to have it be this public use um, space as well. So I situated the classrooms on the second floor, and that's completely, um, not completely secluded, but it's harder to get to than the first and third floor. So the first floor, since it's on the bottom, I made it completely public space. So you have a cafeteria in here that could be used for events and meetings and things like that. And then there's also a library that can be used as a public library as well um, on the bottom floor. And then on the top floor, there is a, a shaded rooftop space. And then the bridges connect to it as well from the housing. And so um, like the project in O'Hare, I wanted to create a community that can sustain itself based on local gardening and um, farming. So. The Aerophonic Gardens uh, provide fruits and vegetables and um, tea leaves and coffee beans for the shops that are here, um, as well as they all have their um, a few of these Aerophonic Towers as well so that um, diners can see them while they're dining in these places and also provide more food um, since this is more of a public park as well. Um, it's a more private way to get that food. And then the farms provide meat, milk, and eggs, um, and the chickens provide the eggs um, for the bakeries and the restaurants and the coffee shops to use as well. And then, so this is a view of the farm park. Um, it has, like I said, goats, sheep, and pigs, and there is these designated paths for the humans to use and then these open fields for the animals to use so that they can have an interaction without disrupting either of their functions too much. And then the um, animals also have their shading elements to keep them comfortable, and they can also feed off of these. And then here's a view of the aerophonic garden that I was talking about. So these towers um, provide the food for this, so it's more of a community garden and people can pick fruit off of them and eat it. Um, at these tables or they can prepare a meal for a group or have a picnic or something like that. Um, and it's just, it's a really nice space to be in. As you can see with all the lush greenery, it really doesn't feel like you're in a city like Austin. And then um, lastly, I wanted to talk about the rooftop spaces. So like I mentioned, each housing cluster has its own rooftop space that can serve a variety of functions. Um, as well as the school has its own. So for the school, it's a classroom, but other functions that I thought could be used in these rooftop spaces are cinema, um, a gym, an art studio, a community garden, and extra dining space for larger groups. And so this is a view of a couple of those rooftop spaces. So you can see in the foreground, you have additional dining space and people enjoying a meal. And then in the background, you can see this shaded element um, facilitates the use for yoga posing um, and doing yoga and kind of having a gym in the background. And so it brings the community together in another way, um, in addition to the community spaces within the main 
um, voids of the housing. And it also, because of these shaded elements, you feel like you're indoors, even though you're actually outdoors and you have this kind of secluded area in a city. And that is my project. Well, thanks so much. I'll start off. I think, you know, first of all, congratulations on um, the breadth of the, uh, of the project. Um, it's really interesting to kind of see, you know, the the amount of complexity in terms of integrating this closed loop or closed knit system on top of the kind of formal explorations. Um, I guess initially some some uh, questions or opportunities that I was curious about is kind of, and maybe you can toggle to the kind of overall exonometric that shows the, the site. Um, but just, and I guess even before that, the kind of uh, library of elements that were deployed uh, I was curious, um, you know, like I'm seeing kind of this walled condition a bit that's uh, creating a, a, a definite, you know, kind of opaque boundary uh, to the site. And so curious kind of within the typology of, of deployable units, you know, this walled condition, was that thought of as a, a separate element? And to what opportunity could boundary and enclosure be accomplished with the the units that you've developed. Um, I just think either there's a, an opportunity to incorporate, you know, I'm intrigued by the kind of monolithic deep poche of the, the bounded elements. And curious what opportunities that would, those would have coming into the site in terms of allowing for like enough soil volume to actually have vegetation beyond the kind of scrim screens um, more deeply integrated into the site. Um, and I guess on that same uh, kind of idea, curious to what extent you know you thought about it in in landscape architecture, kind of within the field that I, I work in. A lot of times we are using vegetation as the device to create enclosure and boundary. So curious if there were opportunities to actually think about vegetation as a deployable unit, because you know, as the designer, you're also able to dictate where the the trees and and some of the vegetation is going and, and so I see a little bit up near the kind of northern farm portion it looks like some articulation with the actual planting but I, I think there are maybe the opportunities to, to let the actual vegetation design start to inform some of the spaces a bit more um, and rely a little less heavily on on the screen walls because I think there are probably some, some challenges about having that screen wall disassociated from the ground and the soil volume in terms of actually getting vegetation to grow on them. So I think, um, you know, thinking about that unit also paired with volume entry, actually uh, embracing poche in terms of soil volume or, you know, water conveyance, water storage, I think, you know, in the sections actually Thinking about some of the mechanical and soil logistics could uh, enrich, and I think the, the section a bit more. Um, but overall, you know, uh, I'm intrigued by the. I mean, a few of the the renderings showed very kind of compelling spaces. I think the all of the rooftop spaces where you achieve that, you know, really dynamic dappled light and you know enclosure of an outdoor space, especially with the heat that Austin deals with, you know, I think it's a successful kind of outdoor space. So yeah, congratulations on you know, just the, the project itself. Appreciate it. Thank you. Maybe I can continue. I hello to everyone. Probably my face is now, I don't know, four square meters <laughs> in the room. But um, 
Yeah, um, thank you, Danai, for uh, kicking off today's discussions and presentations. It's like super exciting, actually, also to see a bit like how the project developed since I had seen, I was privileged to see it on uh, pre-finals. And uh, to me, like the probably most beautiful drawing that you now presented today is this um, communal spaces diagram, which had the range of the green, like, you know, green kind of shades. And yeah, I'll go back. I think I'm back now a bit. I was there in between somewhere. <laughs> yeah, this one. Yeah, communal spaces. Because I, th I think it like tells a lot about the sensibilities that you brought into the discourse. Um, I think you uh, have a especially good eye for understanding the range of activities and the range of functions. Not in the sense that, you know, like we have to put this and this, this, but how these functions can organically create a continuous landscape. And I find it beautiful in your project. Um, I think what would be fantastic, and maybe I also somehow pointing towards a bit of prior comment, I think what would be yet fantastic and to uh, achieve that complexity with understanding of the vegetation, which you now have like already uh, like in mind and in the project as active body of your project, yet it strikes sometimes as a monocultural approach in, into the planting because we still have, maybe it's also coming with the programs, you know, so this is for me also a, a matter of discussion a bit. I, I'm not putting it out as a criticism. I think that's very difficult for us, especially as architects to really um, address that because we also don't possess that knowledge of, you know, how to really treat vegetation with the, the profound understanding of its life on its own. But like I see that, you know, rendering prior and I'm thinking, you know, we have these, you know, monoculture of trees, then monoculture of ivies, then monoculture of grass. And I'm wondering, you know, if the project could still benefit from diversification of those plant layers in the way you already achieve that multiplicity of functions and multiplicity of of spaces per se, you know? So to me, like it's so, sort of, it seems that the, that layer of a project is not completely matching up. But being said that, uh, said, um, you know, I think that it's really a very fertile ground, so to say for us to really, all of us to think how we assume, how we know and how we perceive what we call greenery in the city. Um, is that become, is that what we think now in our current, you know, uh, paradigm, something that we apply on the building, you know, or we give its own agency. And that means to me, maybe we also give up certain, you know, certain agency. So that means we cannot really know anymore how this vegetation unfolds. So we cannot tame it. We cannot put it in the, you know, certain rectangle we cannot put it anymore we cannot assign it and then it, i think that opens a very different perspective how that project could be looking like in 10 or 20 years and i think that's a very exciting promise of this conversation to me because i don't think you know we we kind of have now like a a, a peak of you know of a moment but of course through all these layers that you implemented in your project you know the whole um um, actors that we cannot control and con contain within the architecture that we are designing, you know, I think that will produce extremely interesting and unforeseen results. And I would like invite, you know, to reflect and speculate about it a bit within the project. So this is for me very interesting uh, to see how what you achieved. And yeah, thank you for that. And congratulations, of course. It's been, I think, interesting semester. <laughs> Okay, um, probably um, most part, I think uh, I agree with Inder and actually um, I really appreciate uh, your works in particular for the way you layering up all this um, group of uh, functional that you try to analyze it um, to establish your own program. In particular, when you come up with this zone for the greeneries, um, of course, um, there is one step to be done that I think all of uh, us uh, think that it just 
you need another step. It is not a form of criticism at all. It's just um, the step that you can grow up a little bit more on that, in particular with the vegetation and how you, you can create probably just um, a kind of, uh, I will leave it as a question, what, what form of relationship or uh, configuration or spatial arrangement that will allow us to have this kind of, to establish the relationship between vegetation and the whole program that you already work on it, super beautiful. Um, so I, I would agree that it would be really exciting to see how you can set up um, the new relationship that could form. And in particular, when we talk about um, the noise pollution in the city, um, probably you can even work on it a little bit more as you work on the program of urban farming as well. That will be really practical question because in most of the big cities um, to deal with noise pollution in particular in Bangkok or in other Asian cities, it's a really tricky question even for landscape architects. And so in this case, um, yeah, probably just a little bit more elaboration on um, this question about the relationship between vegetation and your architectural program and let all of these effects from the noise pollution to integrate back into your program. Probably that's something would be really exciting to look at it afterwards, yeah. Thank you. And it, it took me quite a pleasure to, to get into your project because I think you responded to the brief uh, that's different. Like when the brief like begins with uh, the Calvas interviews that with this kind of circular kind of housing uh, project, then you would at first expect that in a way everything in a way is is a way really le leveraged. You know? everything in a way belongs to each other. But then uh, uh, you start, for example, and you explain a bit like your your ingredients in a way or the, the bits and pieces of this project. In, in a kind of circular way at first. So for example, with the trees, so you say, hey, I use the trees for carbon sinking. But then uh, you have maybe, let's say, 100 or 200 trees on the side. And if one tree uh, sinks 40 kilograms of CO2 per year, you know, you, it would mean on the current condition, you need 400 trees per person per year to sink actually the person's carbon. So if you take it realistic, or even if you reduce the two tons, we talk about 50 trees per person. So for the housing project, we are up to, what is it then? Even in the best condition, we are already talking about 3,000 trees or so, more than no? 50 times people. So, so it's clear that the same, like it continues that you, you take the, the chicken eggs, now there's a bakery, how, how, how much eggs the, the bakery needs? Uh, so, and, and and so on. So so it's clear that that uh, the project is fundamentally open. So it's in a way you use uh, architecture as uh, in a very traditional way, as uh, in a very picturesque way. That you're more interested in a way that in a way outlines or, or exposes a, a a different living condition of nature. In a way. That for this, I understand that you're looking for that. It's not like, in a way, you're not a technician. You're not looking as an engineer, like really closing this community, which anyhow doesn't work in a global uh, society and economy, but you're looking for uh, architectural devices or how architecture in a way enables a different way of living. And then you have, you have two images or, which goes in, or circling it back, maybe also the critique what Kevin had at the beginning, one is like you have the, the image, uh, the human perspective of the happy pig. Like there's a there's a there's a kind of window condition in, in one of the images, like the so very nice one uh, where you like show that the, you're in this kind of uh, animal farm. Uh, not not this one, like this here. 
So that, when you think about this, of course, a pig uh, wouldn't mind if it's a green or if it's a, a pathway of concrete or whatever floor. Huh? So for me, it means that this is actually a window or that you put here like, or you, now you're behaving architecturally as you would put a window or you, you put a transparent barrier. So the same is for the sheep between the sheep and a, and a, and a, and a, and a ground where like kids play or, or, or whatever. So, so you're putting in a way, begin to, to think architectural devices or, or plantations of walls or something, or transitions between terminal spaces actually in an opening between next year and next year. And, and I think this is like uh, fundamentally different than uh, you would even postmodernism or like not even in the last generation. 20, 30 years, or even parameticism would think about architecture because you would always enclose. You would always like think of a facade or like, like placing, placing walls would be always between territories. Or now when Kevin said, hey, you, you place actually using landscape for making a barrier. So, but this is a bit different because it's not only a barrier, it's about like this transition between. And now it's between the next year and next year. So think about this further, what it means when you like, you merge so radically this kind of transition of spaces that you don't have any more this differentiation between interior, exterior, and so on, but not, you, you completely lose that for, for different kind of thinking how you connect that spaces or, or thinking that even. So, so this I think is like a nice, and then when you think it's further now you have on the side plan, you have, for example, this, uh, you make a sound protection course, which are not really worked out yet. But, but I think that maybe it would be a next step. I think there would be, I would be interested if you work for on this project, how actually those walls are articulated in this kind of, when you see in the middle of that image, this kind of like, is a bit bridge, is a bit this farming, is a bit this kind of, yeah, like, like with animals, not only like, like, uh, Salads and lettuces or such stuff. So, like, how did the way this becomes like really like a, a, a wall or like a landscape device, which is the same time architecture? So, this is interesting moments in your project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denai, for the great completion of your project, for sharing with us and being first. <laughs> So I would like to welcome next student, uh, Regan, uh, and thank you very much for all advices, uh, all comments, which embrace really interesting topics. We can learn a lot from each of you. And um, we could start our next presentation. Um, our next student, Regan, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Give us your project. Thank you. Hi, I'm Reagan, and this is my project. <clears throat> so this semester, I've been interested in the idea of vertical green spaces and how to integrate that into cities. One pre precedent I studied to kick off this project was China's lose out featuring towers completely covered in trees and plants to combat air pollution. And it features nearly 40,000 trees and almost a million plants. <clears throat> it also has a rail line, homes, two schools, and a hospital all within this complex. <clears throat> For my energy cycle research, I studied urban forests, parks, green belts, um, and other green spaces like that in the middle of big cities, such as Austin. They're an important part of Texas's natural resources and they provide recreational, health, environmental, and economic benefits, as well as creating a wealth of localized jobs. And then perhaps most importantly, these forests also reduce annual air conditioning, energy use, and filter pollutants from the air. So I collaborated throughout the semester and on this project with Emma and Cassandra, who will present shortly after me. We worked together on a concept of one site that was split into three different elements that provide housing and food park, 
a public green and garden space, and then natural energy and waste disposal. So I will focus on the urban forest and garden element of the cycle in green. This diagram outlines the resources production and consumption of our system. So it consists again of an anaerobic digester that processes waste and turns it into energy, an urban forest and gardens, and then living quarters and a food park. As you can see, the produce from the urban gardens and forests provides fresh produce to the residents and the food park, while bio waste from the plants and waste from the resident living and dining quarters is processed by the anaerobic digester and then turned into fuel, which can be used to grow more plants and gardens and then fuel these homes. Um, you can see in this interwoven process, it's detailed again in the spatial cycle. This maps the goods produced and consumed by each part of the system. And then together they combine to create a largely self-sustaining community with recycled waste and self-grown food products. So I broke the urban forest and garden into three different categories. Um, urban food forest, which includes the planting and maintenance of local and fruit producing trees, and then indoor gardens consisting of greenhouses and hydroponic gardens, and then outdoor gardens. And both of these gardens produce food that again goes to the residents and the food park that is located on the site. For our site location, we chose a plot of land that's largely unoccupied and it's at the end of the orange bus line. It's in one of Austin's largest food deserts, so access to fresh produce is particularly important. It's adjacent to the Dell campus and provides a possibility for a future collaboration in living and working between the two sites. We divided the site into public space, residential and dining, um, and anaerobic system. And then this green space illustrates where the urban forests and gardens will be placed. So to begin the form, I drew from a previous study that was completed using the themes of enfilade, gallery, and pochet. I explored a concept of simple horizontal bars that gain complexity and interaction through animation and movement along horizontal axes. So you can see in this animation in the top right, that movement from the simple um, four different colored bars. And then as they move in different levels, they become much more complex. Um, and then moving on to second set of animation studies, these show the movement of the blocks and the paths from axon and plan views. So again, going with the theme of a simple H form and bars that are connected by a series of paths and how those can move and have different formations through animation, but still have connectivity through these paths. Um, moving on to form and circulation. So I began to work with a concept of individual blocks interlocked with paths that weave, rise and fall. And you can see these in orange on the right. They provide a meandering mountain-like method of exploration between these different bars. Um, to layer the program, I began to think about which blocks could serve which program best using three main con program concept blocks, forest, indoor and outdoor gardens. You can see that the forest blocks comprise the lowest levels and they're staggered and continuous for optimal tree root growth. And that's shown on the left. And then the greenhouse garden and the public space blocks hover at and above the tree blocks layering on top of that first level. I then further developed the program layers into three general types of spaces that comprise this park. They are urban forest, gardens and greenhouses, and then public green space. And all three of these functions are woven together in one large park. This complete axon shows how all three of the programs fit together into the site, together creating a complex park with food production, urban forests, and then hike and bike trails linking all three. And the site axon demonstrates the structure's layout on the general site and its relation to a potential trail that could link the remainder of the programs, which you'll see in the next two presentations. And then I'll just move through these three renderings. You can see the experience of wandering that path and the variety of programs and levels that surround you with the greenhouses growing plants, outdoor gardens, and then public green spaces. 
This path, <clears throat> series of paths allow visitors to experience the site as an interactive park and a public garden with hike and bike trails to and from the neighboring residential and dining spaces. Thank you. Thank you very much. Regan. Maybe I can start with a couple of questions if it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Regan. It's super beautiful to see how you uh, how you move towards the end of the term. Um, can you a little bit give us insights about like you know quantification of your project in a way because you're talking about production and consumption cycles right a lot mm -hmm. so and then you you create this ring around like the, the site that you share with other colleagues could you give us a bit of insights how you you know evaluate the program and what is about what is being consumed and produced in general for your site just like from the conceptual perspective sure yeah i'll go ahead and flip back um to the diagram too because that's probably more helpful than just hearing where it's coming mm -hmm. super perfect thank you um yeah so you'll see this illustrated more with the following two presentations since i'm just one chunk of the three-part site but um all of the produce from the indoor gardens and from the green uh, the outdoor green spaces in my park feed into um, restaurants and residential housing that will be detailed in the next presentation. And then that in turn produces waste, which is processed by the third chunk. And that gets recycled back into the parks, um, creating soil um, nutrients to regrow those plants and fuel those gardens. So maybe I continue then. The reason I was uh, like uh, wondering about it is because of course we would all love to, you know, have this model working. <laughs> and often the reason why these models are not implemented yet in reality is <laughs> to say, because they're coming with the shortcomings that, you know, they cannot sustain our life completely. And you mentioned something about Austin food desert and it intrigued me, you know, how, how how it relates to existing situation, you know, and how much this model can sustain and compensate. I, I also don't think that, you know, we can substitute from status A to status B, you know, without having kind of interrelationship between different models of our living. But it would be very, I think, important for your project to really assess this information and understand, you know, where it can relate with existing realities, like really per, you know, numbers, in the city and where do you stand here with your proposition and i think that it's you know it's a very powerful proposition and uh, of course i'm very intrigued with your spatial uh, uh, layering i think it produces uh, yeah very beautiful spaces and i think that there is a lot of like space that is that is something like being underneath and i, I think it's some somehow it's po powerful and poetic to think that I'm walking underneath the forest or I'm working walking underneath the greenhouse, you know? And I think that that could be for me, like whole project that could just pitch it, you know, through this like extremely poetic feeling of being underneath these things that we never be are underneath, just by, you know, you, you kind of layering it in, and putting like it in the terracing and verticality. I think that produces some unexpected effects, which I find very, very, curious and exciting and I think as such as a project it's therefore very successful because you you found something very spatial you can you know evolve and continue with this interest in the future that being said of course you know then it poses a lot of questions how the ground looks like and what is the differentiation on the ground and I, I think that there is still potential to work you know in understanding for example of the slabs you know, between like the slab of the forest versus the slab of the public space versus the slab of, of the greenhouse. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like projecting to the future of the project because for me, it gives the, the power and trust that it's possible, you know, to do this type of architectures and this type of um, 
this type of uh, spatial configurations and and therefore i think it's very interesting project and successful one yeah, i might uh, jump in and build on that so thanks Raven, for the the project it's really you know interesting i'm excited to also see the kind of full site but you know really intrigued by your project and i think part of the success for me is built off of the initial spatial animations integrating the circulation from the get-go, such that as you kind of um, deploy this arrangement, the circulation feels extremely integrated and you know believable to, to a certain extent. And I also kind of echo the previous comment of I think there's something very intriguing about uh, kind of guiding or choreographing the user through elevational changes and that um, experiential quality of moving up and down through a canopy layer and elevating a person higher into the, the vegetable canopy and then also the opportunity for then bringing you know the forest slab or you know, the ground the, the vegetated ground plane up and the opportunities of having vegetation that's usually below the canopy you know, typically the stratification of vegetation is canopy understory and ground cover are the three broad categories of landscape within a, a forest uh, you know, condition. So the opportunity of these elevated slabs that are vegetated as a way to invert and allow vegetation access to sun that maybe typically isn't creates a, a pretty dynamic opportunity for a, a, a new type of forest. You know, typically that stratification through the, the vegetal column is all about access to light. And so as you start to invert the access to light, I think there's, you know, unique opportunities. Um, one, I guess, kind of critique building on that would be in this image in the top left, <clears throat> there's, you know, obviously the forest open space and then the productive greenhouses, but then there's an additional kind of grayed out um, shape that is, to me, a reading still as a continuation of the forest. So I wonder what opportunity you actually think of the ground plane as the forest and let that be a static datum. And then your occupiable terraces and you know, kind of transposed ground forest ground planes are the things that allow a lot of moves. So I think you know there's additional forest that's not being rendered currently that would I think increase the enclosure and the and the experience of transversing up and down through this canopy. But uh yeah, I, I, I'm really intrigued by you know inverting a little bit the relationship with the typical forest condition. May I continue? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, um, for your project, I would say that um, I, I really imagining about uh, the potential to think a little bit more through um, the smaller loops that can happen around um, the main axis. Um, so right now we just see um, the strong axis um, from the main one, but what could be a little bit more layering on the top of all of this just to soften down the whole skin a little bit and with a little bit of more um, probably ideas about uh, the pocket space that could happen and yeah, to carve it a little bit more um, clearer. Probably this could really be an interesting scheme, yeah. So for me, I, I just wondered about um, the potential to develop a little bit more on the secondary axis and to see how um, it can expand um, its own relationship with uh, the site itself and how it could create some kind of um, probably um, typical vegetation that you can find in the place and how you can relate it back to the site um, somehow that I did not see it quite clear in, in the first two proposal yet. Um, 
what kind of uh, typical landscape characteristics that you can bring it back to the site in the suburban areas or in the urban areas of uh, Austin itself. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the first room you're going to be again, like at the school, and you're now on the fifth floor of the building here in Westmore. And when you look out of the window, actually the trees are higher than the fifth floor. You're actually in the middle of the canopy here. Like it goes, I would say, to the eighth floor or something. So when I see, when I compare that, like, not just this one, one to one experience, okay, maybe the campus has like mini oils and, and very majestic trees, but uh, your trees, they're like, when it compares to the existing buildings, which are like, let's say three or four levels, the trees are even much smaller. So I think that, Jen, like your project can be easily three times, or should actually be rendered three times bigger. I think, which would be uh, which would be uh, a very simple move for at first. Also, the same as this kind of blue, the, the when you just look to the bird view, then you now have the blue glass house. Would be now the the living uh, the residential kind of blocks. They would have a similar size. So now you would begin to stack or see them as integrated or part of this kind of fabric. Now, like you, you're weaving in a way like. You could easily weave that thing what you have, your proposal, with actually existing buildings. That's a, that, that's a, I think when, when you think at first, it's actually quite nice, like how now those kind of images get really much more integrated. Because also what you, uh, when I looked at to the, to the kind of park landscape, it's also interesting, like structurally or architecturally most more, that it looks actually you put a roof on a roof. So when you think that further, it's, uh, it's, it's nice that in itself is already like a stacking of, of uh, roof, roof landscapes. It's, it's not just like a, a single surface project. So it's, it's already like, like really you have an experience as you like between this, this kind of roofs. And I think Indre, Graz or Vienna, like that is exactly it, that you have all this jumping kind of uh, roofscapes and also a lot of like started with roof terraces that people put trees on and, and, and I think there's a high potential this, this to continue. And when you think like here in Texas, also we, we had already like some side images. When you see the existing roof, that's exactly just the blind spot here actually. And there's so many paved or closed surfaces which have the potential which should actually be open or should be programmed and, and so on. So, so that's I think for the next step for integrating this in a site that's like the project is actually is quite nice. So yeah, and then also when you change the scale, when you think of now how people cross or access this, now the sidewalks they're maybe like a bit small also. Like now when when they would be not sidewalks anymore, but like more like boulevards. So that I can like you read also bicycle bicycle bicyclists, but not yet bicycle lanes. And like it's, it's very uncomfortable when you, uh, like because they're so narrow, like uh, two by two persons cannot cross, or two persons and one bicyclist. Not that, that like is it, it would be just like always one has to jump off the, the, the sidewalk and so on. So it would be a different way of working, the walking, but then also you it could offer like areas for for programming actual space. Not the, the typical thing is like the, the, the street cafe, but also you talk about urban farming. So, so I'm, uh, I assume that you could also maybe directly buy there, like these, these vegetables or so, or, or maybe it's also for storing and picking up or, or whatever. Like it, it's not like one comes to the next. Yeah, but, but I think the most successful thing is, is kind of half interior kind of uh, the, the, the renderings of those, those kind of landscape conditions. So this, uh, I would wish you can further on like elaborate uh, on them. I think they, they have a great potential. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comments. Very interesting insights for us to think about it. Um, 
Thank you, Regan, for presenting your project. And uh, we would like to go to the next project from Emma. Emma, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you very well. So I've named my project the Elevation Food and Living Park. So we started the semester by researching some different cycles and how they can take form and exist in more dense urban environments like Austin and how they can create a better way of living that's more sustainable for residents and the environment. So within our group, which was Regan, Cassandra and I, we explored combining an anaerobic system with food and living programs, and then also including uh, urban gardens and parks that Regan just presented and combining all of those onto the same site. So my project is looking deeper into exploring how the food production and dining environment can be combined directly with uh, residential units. So the food waste from both of those programs um, would be redirected into the anaerobic system. And that would really cut back on landfill waste and just provide a cleaner way of converting natural resources to energy, which is a big problem in many cities is how um, architecture can kind of help address the way that this waste is being managed. So our cycle is utilizing this organic waste to create as close as possible to a net positive um, complex that doesn't rely heavily on non-renewable resources for power production. So people are really becoming the core element of our cycle by producing this food waste that turns into um, bio waste in the anaerobic digester. And in turn, the cycle is really, um, it's giving value to this organic waste that's normally being sent to a landfill. It's turning it into a more sustainable resource. Uh, it's cutting back on waste that's going into landfills and it's also generating jobs because the plant itself has to be managed. So our overall cycle is connecting these three projects with the main aspect being bio waste. Um, you can see that the bio waste is coming from people that are living in these residential units and also from pruning the urban garden and forest that Regan just talked about. So not only is it individual families that are producing this food waste, but also scraps from the uh, food park, the dining area that would also be kept separate from landfill waste and transferred over to the anaerobic system. So then once it's in this anaerobic digester, it is then broken down through the digestion and it decomposes where the methane gases are captured and contained in a sealed tank. And those are used to drive electricity and generate more energy in a more clean way. And then the physical waste could also be used as compost and put back into the urban gardens. So one of the precedents I analyzed was by Boba Architects in Morocco, and they had built residents for a local farming community and included some guest pavilions in with the design. So I really liked how they were using this uh, modular shaper container and how it was housing different programs, but still creating a very cohesive field of parts. So this is just one of the pavilions that was uh, more of a public gathering space. And I also liked how they incorporated the vegetation into each um, unit. A second project I looked at was the Park and Play by Jaja Architects, and I was mainly interested in their use of greenery, how it was stretched over the facades and in between surfaces, and the use of uh, the cables to lead its growth upward. So the first main component of my cycle is the residential units. And 
I had the idea that they would be designed very similar to tiny homes where they're only around 600 square feet. Every unit would have greenery draped around it and also have some sort of vertical herb garden on its facade. The main area that's contributing to the cycle is the kitchen space within the residential unit because that's where the food waste and the food preparation would be taking place. And so that would be kept separate from other garbage and recycling and then transported to the anaerobic digester on site. Um, the next part of the cycle where the majority of the food waste would come from would be the kitchen units, which would make up the whole ground level of the design. So there would be a variety of food and drink options similar to a food court where you would order from the individual um, food container or food kitchen. And then you would take your food and you would um, sit in this kind of public informal dining area. And each of these kitchens would have a little bit of uh, their own produce being grown around it, whether it's on the facade or some of them have some tiered garden beds. And then again, this food waste would be kept separate and transported to the digester. So. When I began designing the spatial layout of my cycle, I explored a couple different architectural themes with the first one being um, transitioning from a shale layout to a labyrinth. So this is just the plan view of the elements as they started moving. Um, they started here in the shale formation and as they moved, it turned into more of a labyrinth. And so I'll show that animation. And uh, the main parts of it are the containers that are being used for the kitchens on the bottom floor. And then the living containers are the above three levels. And then there's plates in between them, which turn into the walkways. And also these hook structures that are um, creating a relationship between the plates as they move in some areas. It's stopping them from moving or it's catching them and just creating more dialogue between all of the plates as they move. And then the next set of themes uh, I looked at was transitioning from a gallery to a labyrinth formation. So again, this is the, just the plan view of how they started um, organized in more of a gallery view. And as the animation occurs, they end up in a labyrinth. And then um, after watching how all these parts interacted with each other and exploring these layouts, um, we then chose where on the site my portion would be inserted of the design. So we all chose the same site and it's right at the edge or the very beginning of the orange line. So this drawing right here, the purple is actually where the orange line starts. So our site is within walking distance. And the red area here is where the residential and food park would go. The lighter yellow area is just um, open public gathering space. The orange area over here would be where the anaerobic system would be. And the green space all around is uh, trails and gardens, urban gardens. Okay, so this is just a segment of the design and plan with a cut through the residen residential units on the fourth floor. 
Um, in this drawing, you can see, uh, since it's on the fourth floor, the layers below, how those plates are overlapping, interlocking, and creating more of a labyrinth pathway through the whole design. And then a fragment in section. And this one, you can see how the spaces in between the residential units are being occupied and turning into like these informal gathering areas where people could meet up and hang out. And then a diagram that's color coding the programs to clarify some of the elements more. So all of the tan containers on the bottom are dedicated to food production and that's what makes up the food park. The green containers are the living spaces that are scattered through the second, third and fourth floors. Uh, the red canopy covered areas are the more unique programs that are promoting the gathering and connection between residents. And then the plates that are being cut through are the labyrinth pathways. And then the same diagram, but with some of the communal spaces labeled. So there would be a a variety of programs happening in the red areas. There could be community gardens, outdoor kitchens, lounge areas, workout rooms, co-working spaces. And then the bottom would also be communal because that's where the food park is and all of the dining tables, chairs could also be just area to create connection between residents. And then this drawing, I was focusing on the carbon footprint to show how the design works to reduce CO2 emissions. So there's um, many different types of greenery throughout the design, and they're all working to purify the air and also reduce the structure's heat gain. But another big aspect that's really contributing to a greener, kind of healthier lifestyle or healthier habits would be the localization of all these elements. So using locally grown produce in the kitchens on the first level that are coming from Reagan's urban garden would cut out a lot of the importing and exporting emissions and just having a blend of like living, dining, gathering spaces all interlaced together here in this one community would eliminate the need to commute and drive anywhere. So that would also be cutting back a lot on CO2 emissions. And then I just have a few perspectives to end the presentation. So this one is just showing what it would be like to be immersed in the design with all these different greeneries happening at different levels around you. Um, another perspective, this one's on the second floor and you can see on the left, one of these flex spaces where you could maybe meet up or hang out with other residents. And then lastly is the uh, food park on the main level or the ground level. So you could order from any of these containers. They would kind of be operated like food trucks where it's just the individual um, company or family running the kitchen. And after you order, you would take your food and you could sit anywhere within the food park. And after your meal is finished, then you would separate your waste from your um, or the organic waste. And that would then be taken to the digester to be re recycled. So this is my last slide. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions about the project or just look forward to hearing some feedback. It's a, it's a very nice project. Like, uh, you're very good in, uh, in graphic uh, representation, like from the, from the first analysis to now to, to those uh, like really very atmospheric dense images. Like, it uh, was already like graphically, like, I think. Uh, they they were prepared so it, it those I don't mean like just as a nice image but like the the representations are very thoughtful in a way like uh, they very complicated to to the content also what you speak and so on so that's that's already the, the first. Thank um, you. 
I, I was in the first like at the beginning. I was a bit skeptical when you talked about containers uh, and living because who wants to live in a container? <laughs> and you made a you made in a way like a smart move. Uh, those kind of containers are like more as kind of you can think of them as as kind of thick columns or so. So so you compress in a way everything which has to be private private. And, and then you have this this bridges, which uh, at, at first like virtually they look like well, what like what the what the kind of chaos in a way you know like uh, just as bridges, but as soon as you show a section or like when you show sort of plan, how you actually fill the the in between space then with actually with programs or a kind of open program then like yeah this the section and the plan, I mean. They, uh, they could be more, more radical than like any kind of sofa or so on. It's really on that kind of in between space. But you see that it's a, it's a second kind of closure, or like it's uh, like you have once like this, this columns which are not really columns because they're not straight through. There's a kind of also kind of, kind of stacks of this, this container bricks. And, uh, and then they, they create this. Quite nice open space, uh, spaces which are, but still like quite ordered because they are they're, they're aesthetified. So they, they, they come to when they're well proportioned in terms of like for, for, for living or what you expect or what you're comfortable with and normal. But then they, those spaces open up to this kind of semi interiors and then like really like a, a, a full courtyard and, and so on. So that's, uh, I think, uh, very, very successful in this project. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'll I'll jump in and kind of echo those comments. I think you have a diagrammatic uh, elevation kind of showing the program that I thought was um, pretty compelling to kind of describe the density. It was the kind of color coded massing. Kind of a perspective elevation, this one, yeah. And I think to you know, Dana's comment about the, the program actually almost being the, the structural element that's staggered throughout it, I think the density that you've um, kind of implemented the, the volumes, is, at least in the perspective, feels appropriate in terms of maintaining the porosity and kind of openness um, for light and, and ventilation. So I, I feel like the horizontal density seems seems right and, and is achieving a really nice quality of, of space and the potential maybe to go a little higher to increase density seems seems like there's still enough porosity in, in your massing that would still allow light through. But I think you know this kind of um, almost uh, belt it's kind of an exterior loaded corridor but that's been kind of pulled apart and dissolved a bit it's creating a, a really nice um, kind of stacked uh, circulation and occupiable spaces that feels comfortable in terms of, of occupation and not claustrophobic at all so i think that uh, is executed well um, and then yeah i think you know i think we're looking more at kind of the scale of of a chunk of the of the unit. I, I'd be curious if you can go back to kind of the overall plan in terms of the opportunities. It seemed like it was kind of a loop of massing that occupied the site. Um, yeah, this this drawing. So I think you know a lot of the perspectives are shown from kind of within one of the three arms of the of the triangle, and I think there's a, a definite opportunity to describe what's happening in that void. Um, I know maybe the next project is going to talk about the public space, the kind of yellow shade here. But I mean, you're you're inscribing, you know, a very public exterior space too that also has a lot of opportunity because um, that's a very different condition of being within the the mass aggregation of the three legs of the triangle. So I'd be curious, you know, what that space could be, both from a programmatic um, spatial standpoint, you know, as a public space or if that pairs well with some of the ground floor um, aspects of the the living, I mean, you could you're getting a lot of like 
unobstructed sunlight there. So is that the bulk of some of the restaurant food growth and, and kind of to what end that uh, that space, which is is pretty distinctly different than all the other spaces in terms of access to light, you know, what opportunities at the site scale um, there are. But yeah, I appreciate the the presentation, both you know, individual drawings and just the the kind of way you walk through the, the presentation is very clear. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I would have liked to explore this kind of central space more. I think I did envision it as the dining kind of growing out into that space, but it also being um, like having some unique parts. I talked about earlier, like around the midterm about maybe having like a dog park or more, more just kind of unique programs, um, but I did not get to actually representing those spaces. So that would, I think, be nice. So maybe there is space for me <laughs> to comment. Uh, yeah, I, I have to totally uh, agree with the colleagues already. You know, it's super pleasurous to hear structured presentation. And I think that was very strength of the project because the way you could communicate it, you know, it's, 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 really, it's really nice. And I think that the project produces its own uh, very, <laughs> very unexpected speciality through exactly um, the call of the brief to entangle and interweave the different cyclicities. And I, I think that therefore this project is very successful because it, it precisely does that. You know, you, you present us with this, you know, clarity of the cycles and how they communicate to each other, so to say. And I, so this is the compliments from my side. What I'm constantly thinking when looking at these pretty images, you know, that maybe they are a bit too pretty for what you are asking of your project so your your project is somehow you know it's 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 very challenging to consider that you include the visibility or the liveliness of waste in our living environment you know and that doesn't have to be nasty or disgusting or anything but i think that that would uh, require uh, or may maybe it requires a different spatial expression as well you know that you would also I don't know, work with the surfaces and materials and also understanding of um, atmospheric qualities that comes with such, a, uh, with such a promise that there is a question of, you know, smell or a certain porosity or visibility or distances. And of course, these are all these additional layers, you know, it's, it's a lot to ask, but I would like really invite you to critically like, you know, evaluate the beauty of your project and ask yourself, you know, Okay, is this uh, an aerobic digester? Is this the invisible you know, part of your project? Is this something that you put in the basement or lock within the containers and you know, clad it with uh, beautiful layers of materials which are very you know, clean and, and you know, something we all enjoy, of course. That could be approach. But I think that there is a different approach there too. And while implanting that moment um, I think it's not about just putting like three containers with the, I don't know, in Vienna we have, or in Austria we have, you know, green, brown, and yellow, but I think it's way more, right? It, it, it produces its proximity to that level that we don't know yet. So when I'm sitting in the restaurant and, you know, basically consuming the, the, the vegetables that come from the garden in, in, or the terracing in nearby, there is a certain dirt coming with that. And I think that your project is capable to embrace that. And for me, it's also simply reinvestigating, you know, how you treat your surfaces and how you treat your thickness. So you have a lot of beautiful, like layered, entangled, like interlocked plates. And I would wonder, you know, that maybe sometimes they are not just plates to support pots or other, um, materials but they become they're taking over by these materials and by these entities in that sense that i think that maybe even like this radicality of your proposal that if i understood right daniel was exp expressing in the beginning you know it, it would be taken to the different level so this is like where i i wish you know you would come and you would explore maybe in your future projects more you know to to be bolder and more daring with 
what what the premise of your project entails for architecture itself. Yeah, thank you for a beautiful presentation. Thank you for those comments. I I was always I did think a lot about how this waste was actually being organized, and I feel like that part kind of got pushed to the end and left off. So that would be very interesting to keep exploring and push further. Yeah. Maybe I should stop share then. Thank you for the presentation, Emma, for sharing your nice thoughts to our, um, our studio brief. Um, we have a project, an uh, upcoming project from Cassandra. Um, Cassandra, would you like to share your screen? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen? We can see. Okay, perfect. So my project, my portion of the project is the anaerobic system itself and um, how that plays into the other two functions of the um, urban forest or urban farm and the um, residential area. So when looking in the, uh, through the initial research, I really wanted to explore how um, we as architects can address food waste and how we never really uh, talk about how, um, how wasteful and also damaging it is for us to throw away food and for it to be composted and decomposed in landfills leading to higher CO2 um, when we can localize food waste in a healthy and uh, healthy way that also provides to the community. So my first uh, project is um, that I looked into is located in Shenzhen, China, and it was scheduled to be the world's largest waste to energy plant to be built this year, but with the pandemic, it um, still hasn't been completed. But what's interesting about this is that um, they use a series of uh, different programs that doesn't only um, in capture the, um, or not in capture, but um, maximize the productivity of the power plant, but also provides possibilities for um, the workers to have a, an area for rest and um, um, eating while also giving um, a, an area for people to come and learn about the power plant and how it functions and how the entire um, waste to energy can be produced and redistributed into uh, the neighboring city. So another one that I was looking at was by Big, and um, this is located in Uppsala, Sweden, and this kind of has the same um, narrative, except this one gives more of a leisurely approach to um, the power plant. So not only does this provide an educational aspect, but it also provides uh, a ski um, skiing, possibly coffee shops, and also hiking trails, um, along with a top view corridor and a surrounding um, pathway so that you can also experience the power plant uh, without disturbing the functionality. So looking at um, how we can start to think about this in a different scale, I was in contact with Kweeb uh, Renewal, renewables and they make this anaerobic system in a smaller modular um, approach that gives the possibility to re 
relocate the anaerobic system to wherever you need. So I found this really interesting because not only was this transportable, but seeing how this can start to be modularly um, designed vertically um, was something that I was really interested in. So um, in our initial research, we looked at the, um, we created this cycle analysis that started with the anaerobic system that yielded biogas that would create energy for residents um, while also creating digestate from to, pro to provide for the food forest and urban forest. So the, the garden would then be distributed to local restaurants or markets as well as um, local residents. And all of that would be the food waste produced from the markets and the residents would go back into the anaerobic system and the water used um, would go into the hydroponic system that would also be providing um, possibility for <clears throat> um, agricultural um, relief for residential and local markets. So looking at the anaerobic system, so it contains uh, four main components from that transforms food waste into energy um, designed to help really understand the possibility of compact renewable energy to be integrated within um, neighborhoods and communities. So by using this system, we, we get rid of um, brown water and by using just food waste, they've designed this to uh, be completely um, embedded and within this small square space, which I'll go into more with um, in the next slide, but as well as keeping it completely um, odorless within the, the anaerobic system. So first it would require about 3000 square feet of area needed. And um, it is first sent through a food digester that grinds up the particles and is sent into the two uh, shipping containers that uses the gas um, and is uses the gas and stores it into biogas while creating the digestate converter or while tra transversing the organic matter into the digestate converter that can then be used um, into fertilizer by um, taking away the water and um, food waste into two components so that the water can be reused while also providing uh, fertilizer for um, the food forest and uh, local um, urban agriculture. So um, another element that we were exploring was the spatial configuration. And the one that I've uh, aligned closely with, with was element in labyrinth. So looking at the original configuration, um, I down here, I decided to combine them by making two of the elements create the labyrinth and letting them move within each other. So the elements, the square elements would become stagnant, giving it a sort of hierarchy while the longer uh, elements would move freely, um, which creates a series of different type of spatial conditions that um, gives either open, closed, open and, um, sorry, open and inviting spaces compared to closed and intimate spaces. So here we can see, just as an example, this entrance has a really big um, opening, but down here, when it's shifted down, it becomes this opening of the same um, face of the configuration becomes small and intimate while this one uh, becomes open. So looking at our site location, we were giving um, the two options as Professor Rasa uh, mentioned earlier, and we decided to go with the orange line map up here in Tech Ridge. So um, when analyzing this and keeping in mind that we wanted to incorporate a um, 
localized agriculture while also um, providing a market to give local residents a um, fresh food. So this area itself is in a limited access to fresh food area or desert. And as you can see on this map, the farmers markets are pretty um, centralized while the other ones are kind of dispersed, um, scattered depending on like cities. So right here, this is um, the neighboring city that has only one. So trying to provide that equitability of fresh uh, produce to all areas of Austin was our main goal. So looking at the site a little bit closer, here is our site. This is TechBridge. You can see that most of it is residential and it has elements of commercial spaces as well as educational um, facilities or spaces, mainly elementary schools, but one middle and one high school. And right here, these are the two main fresh food sources, which is an HEB that was re recently built and a Walmart. So um, just to reiterate, um, the residential area that Emma was looking into or her design was right here while uh, Reagan was neighboring right here with a uh, possibility of expanding that green area into the center and the space I inhabited was up here on the north end. And um, just to clarify, this used to be a apartment complex, but it is now being de deconstructed. So looking at how the, the element in labyrinths um, spatial configuration can be, or how I started to implement it into my design, I started to look at um, the, or I started to use the spatial configuration or the spatial um, area for the anaerobic system. And I used that as a priority to design and um, configure my, structure. So starting off with um, this pretty um, grid-like configuration, um, it's the each level starts to shift and move in areas while still keeping their, uh, while still keeping connection to what, one another. So here is the superimposed element where you can see all of them are still pretty much connected and have this core center. So this, um, so you'd never really lose um, this idea of structure within the um, area. And then the labyrinth iteration, which I would think, um, which I started to think more of paths um, start to shift as you go up as well. This, these would move freely within the um, levels of the um, element iteration. So right here, you can see how those start to layer down and how they can become one entity and how those um, create interesting overlapping conditions. So the three main conditions that I was looking into and what I found interesting was a colliding condition where the paths would intersect and collide um, inside the um, element iteration. So, or or inside the element. Excuse me. And what was interesting about this is because was that this path starts to create two different spatial conditions within the already enclosed space. The touching condition condition where the path just touches the, the element. And this was, this was interesting to me because it gave a language of privacy where public access would be limited and um, you take away, you, it's not as inviting compared to a path that's intruding that creates um, a sort of threshold that gives the visitor 
the opportunity to explore um, the element more freely without feeling like they're um, really, without feeling like they're not welcome. So a catalog of parts, um, the within my um, project would be mainly the educational uh, entities, which would be a large class, large classrooms, smaller classroom, office spaces, and conference rooms, as well as the anaerobic systems themselves. And um, on the first floor, um, food containers that would take hold and look like the um, shipping containers, but would play into the food market that Emma and Reagan are, Emma and Reagan, we developed. Sorry, that came out weird. <laughs> um, so looking at the floor plan, um, here we can see the third floor plan, how that configuration starts to take place. So right here um, is a perfect example where the path continues within the space and it gives visitors more, um, it encourages visitors to explore um, more freely compared to um, right here, let's say where the path stops and it gives a sense of more, pri a more private um, room compared to down here where the path intrudes on the space, but it creates this dialogue of a threshold where they're able to um, more freely um, explore this area without um, looking further compared to the um, collision. So here is a screenshot of a render um, a section render where you can see those paths um, um, within the center of the structure, kind of giving this exterior more open condition. And um, this portion right here, which is more interior. And um, here is a Photoshop initial um, concept where the paths um, go into the space or into the um, structure. And while these structures are vertically um, stacked, depending on how close they are together when put uh, next to each other, they determine whether or not they're interior or exterior spaces. So here there was a lot of space um, in the, between the elements. So it provided a really nice central courtyard. So here's um, a render of that courtyard with um, the elevator and the bridges connecting the spaces and uh, green areas, moments of green areas for not only people who visit for um, the market, but also for students who need some sort of relief. And then another um, area to see the central courtyard where the elements had more space in between them. And this is the entirety of the structure. And that concludes my project. Thank you, Cassandra. May I ask a question first? <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Um, could you explain to me a little bit about uh, the learning activities that will happen inside of your program and how it relate to your um, spatial configuration and how you handle the whole program? Then? Yes. Um, so I'll go back to the plan. So um, 
something that I found really interesting about having an educational space is having this sort of, excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, having the element and labyrinth speak with each other um, gives the more areas um, of the research facility hierarchy by having um, less movement while the paths um, intrude on the space, which also provides um, the, let's say, well, provides the students with the ability to navigate um, this really intricate um, structure that connects students with the other um, research or um, educational programs of the building. So let's say, for, so for example, um, let's say there's testing for the anaerobic system and development in the anaerobic system, having that labyrinth um, provides um, class, classrooms to be in close uh, vicinity of the anaerobic systems without disturbing the flow of either or. So difficult to understand if somebody wants to jump with comment. <laughs> so sorry for the, you know, for the pauses or whatever. It's very different setup than live one. Anyway, so um, I will be rude and just jump in. Cassandra, thanks for presentation. I think what is uh, interesting in your project that it's or it's different from others that we reviewed that it basically has a very a very different ambition to serve serve on this. Uh, let's say educational level, right? It doesn't really include uh, residential or it plugs in residential, but also it's um, it somehow has to me a very long architectural history, you know, and architectural history, especially in the, so to say end of the 20th century where suddenly the production cycles started to be exposed. You know, if we think, of course you showed some references that you analyzed, but also, you know, this paradigmatic like references like Leipzig of Zaha Hadid, you know, and also what has been done with the, like BMB, you know, and then later what is, has been done in, in Munich, where suddenly we started to expose things in an almost like, you know, um, museological way that has been hidden from, from, let's say, public eye. And I think that's the, the project, uh, therefore it's complicated, you know, it's complicated to me to also assess it because it is, for me, in my understanding, it has such a long history in architecture, how, how it is being dealt, how to cohere the public circulation with the program and so on and so on. So it's, it's a very complex project. So for it, you know, it's also like, um, yeah, for your braveness, it's, I think, uh, a compliment. So where I, I really am difficult to um, see yet the liveliness of it. I see the, you know, the different layers that you addressed and it all somewhat makes sense to me when I hear you talking and I hear you presenting. And I've, I was very intrigued about your spatial conditions that you, you presented this colliding, touching and, uh, and uh, intruding. And I feel like a last step a bit is missing yet. So uh, sorry, I'm so, so for my candor, but I feel like this, this last piece missing in your project which is basically showing the liveliness what it produces, you know, because now we see like massing or, or you know, even the, the, the plan. But yet I, I miss the, the atmospheric and the, the um, life qualities that comes with the program and that the program gives back to what you already encode as an architect a bit. So, you know, like, for example, parts of... Um, understanding, of course, not just through the privacy or publicness within the range of the programs, but also understanding, you know, what kind of uh, spatial dynamics it, it 
it produces. So what parts of this spatial configuration that we see are activated at what point of the day, of the week, of the year, you know, and then at the same time in relationship of that to the production of the energy, right? Because that's that should, should supposed to be a power plant basically. So this, this is a bit like for me, a, a step which I would hope, you know, that you could still like bring your project to. I hope you could understand my comment. I'm a bit like, I want to talk about this project, but of course I'm a bit like lost, you know, because completely. You know, it's not completely like um, resumed. So yeah, thank you for making me think. <laughs> I mean, I, I can just continue on Nicholas' comment. Uh, I mean, sadly, like, it looks like you would need, like, one more week, I think. Like, uh, uh, it's, 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 I think you just didn't complete it now, the, the last step of the drawings. Or well, I see that, you know, like, now the side plan, for example, you just have to move the building a bit off the streets and, and, and those, those things. Like, see, like, is you know, the first iterations to think through with drawings the building, but didn't have yet the time like wants to affect or would need really like one more week, I think, simply. And I mean, also, uh, I mean, intellectually, or with the, the concept, I think it's nice and works. And yeah, it's an interesting comment from, from Indra when you see, especially the, the plan, which brings a reference with uh, those kind of showroom factories. Especially like with uh, which was in the car, like uh, you know, which had also to do like that. Uh, how you think producing something is in itself becomes entertaining. Or see how this all kind of one of the principles completely solved with that also the kind of spatial conditions. And what that spatially mostly meant is that in a way a corridor was not anymore a corridor, but was at the same time an office space or manufacturing space. At the same time, you could manufacture, but also you could uh, visit exactly those, like maybe just the slight glass wall or a curtain, wall, which maybe separate things, but it was more or less in, in open, but not open spaces. And when I see that plan, like you still keep the, the hatching of those, those pathways, uh, but it's clear that also like you differentiate between the pathway and the, and the wall. So there's like a, physical barrier from the pathway and then it's is it like just a texture on the floor or so not like or you feel that this actually in reality this path becomes part of the, the room. Now fingers further what it does actually with the program of like also we know that when you talk about learning environments that that what we completely don't do anymore is like one of this this kind of front teaching. Okay now we, we still do it but we shouldn't do it anymore because anyhow it doesn't work. So it means like what happens now with that kind of learning space when I cross this actually through the middle of it or on the edge. It means that I'm studying in smaller groups or also that it's much more communicative because I'm working maybe on projects or you see how that kind of whole idea of, of, uh, of learning and education you know, is, is a completely different, different program. Full simply how you weave now this, these kind of pathways with, with those kind of rigid boxes. And by the same time, you, it has that still like simplicity maybe in terms of construction. So it doesn't get like this with bricks or saw projects, like so structures so exuberant uh, in, a, in its kind of also budget and so on. So like maybe that could be in a more sophisticated way respond to this kind of spatial needs. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll jump in and, and kind of agree. I think, you know, a little more time just even on this plan to start to populate it with even a label or something to start to describe. I think one of your diagrams showing the kind of three uh, spatial incidences of, you know, intruding, colliding, and I forget the touching. And there, that, to me, that's a lot of the project was the colliding one, the idea of the path segregating the volume and potentially that being two disparate programs or the same program with now a third program circulation intersecting it and what opportunities that has. So I think 
even in your plan drawing, starting to, to code how path, which in right now we're reading kind of as a, a 2D kind of decal on the floor maybe, but you know, what ways are you articulating the kind of intersection of path into volume? Because I think conceptually the idea of you know, colliding two programs that maybe, you know, uh, in terms of control and, and function shouldn't be positive directly on top of each other. I think the spatial strategy that you're using here maybe allows for that to, you know, you're kind of overlaying two labyrinths and thus allowing the kind of control and safety of essentially a working power plant with, with a learning environment. You know, I think there's a lot of, in, you know, to me, intrigue in, in how you accomplish that. So I think there's just maybe that last layer of now kind of proving up the, the strategy of how those two, those three operations for conditions of path and volume, how that really starts to allow these two programs to coexist. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, just a brief one. Probably, I think um, the crucial turning point is um, when you show me the moment you analyze colliding situation, uh, condition, touching, intruding. At that moment, I really look forward. Um, probably the next step of your idea development is that to which degree will you integrate learning process or learning system together with your um, cycles that you did all of this an analysis. So probably with that point that uh, when you did not make a clear point to which degree do you want to integrate it, um, probably after that something get blurred and it's start to hard to handle because as um, all of these learning activities in the buildings can be really complicated to handle and integrate back to your program, which is already a complex one. So probably when you work on this kind of overlapping programs, probably be, be careful a little bit more with, with the step of making each decision. And if you make each step quite clear, probably this will help you to, you know, to size um, the, a really ambitious proposal or a, a really ambitious idea. Uh, I think it has, um, there is no wrong to take such an ambitious um, goal, but the only thing is that uh, to break it down quite clear and know how to achieve it. That, that's why I think, uh, I agree with Daniel, probably you just need a, another week. Um, it's gonna be really, yeah, looking forward proposal. Thank you. Thank you all for comments. Thank you, Cassandra, for presenting a project. Um, really, uh, very interesting to see uh, multiple comments, exploring every cycle in multiple dimension within your comments uh, for all the guests. Thank you so much. And uh, I want also to like compliment students from one side that I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing you not having specific program but speaking about cycles and uh, inventing those programs by yourself during the semester what kind of scenarios atmospheres uh, we didn't mention you know, a level of quantities which was part of our program as well to, to explore it in realistic proportions we made speculations and uh, a kind of uh, human perspectives to show the images and to speak about it. So I really appreciate every comment which was made with Glenn and Drew our uh, fourth and your search towards this direction to reduce this carbon footprint and, uh, and use a neg negative and positive sides and put them into the design and the research during the semester. So thank you so much for everyone participating in the first part. 
if there is maybe some comments, comments on our guest would like to share with us, it would be the moment now. So who would like to say some final words to our uh, research presented today? Yeah, I, I never want to start because I want to be polite, and I feel like everyone is the same, that we always wait to be more polite and patient. <laughs> like, who starts with this? Is the, <laughs> this is the like, and then we have to sign. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for, for the presentations. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I know, like, in the studio, like, it's three months only, it's, it's by far too less. Uh, especially because, like, what we see as as, uh, as a field that uh, we all move or understand that you certainly never do a building anymore alone, ever. That you're not designing alone. And I think we are, before all of what you feel of discussions in the field, that we move actually in bringing much more working in a in a network in a disciplinary way, and in bringing in all these complexities. And have at the moment, we have very much a struggle. What actually is our contribution as an architect? Or what we still can bring on the table, which in a way contributes very specifically, not like full, full design. And, and I think, well, when I see your work, then it's, it, it's of course like you, 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 you bring in all this, this research, which of course you can't really contribute to that field. Right? You're, you're, not, you're not studying environmental uh, uh, strategies. Or not, you're not, you're, you're not <laughs> a biologist and, and so on. Or like there's so many different complexities. But there comes always the move that you make something very unique, uh, uh, special. And, and, and so that there's, I think, uh, or like I think I see the studio very much like thinking not or not producing a final building or proposing this kind of shiny renderings. Because, you know, anyhow, like in reality, you work like three, four years with a team of architects on a project. So how we can expect from you this to do in three months alone? <laughs> so I think it's more like the, the value of that, like that the whole studio is more exactly on this in between. Like when you reflect also what happens and I'm, I'm much more conscious uh, about the, this, this uh, new kind of circular thinking or like thinking in a different way, uh, a project in a city or like how we want to live in future. When you see that shift and how you now as an architect begin to take this on and begin actually to work with that. So this, this I, I found always interesting, what parts of the research you keep or how you filter that and actually make it productive for uh, for for a project or beginning to work on a project. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think you know, having been on a number of these reviews, I'm also always you know pretty blown away by the volume of work and you know understanding a little bit of the kind of uh, technical aspects that go into this type of of design. Mm -hmm. That's sometimes not acknowledged, but to Daniel's comment, the three month time period is also impressive, you know, the, the depth of design skill that you all kind of work on. So I, I do recognize and commend you know, new tools and, and the, the work that goes into that. And then from my perspective, you know, I formerly I trained as a in biochemistry and landscape architecture, but lecture in architecture. So I am always excited about um, you know kind of realizing that the, the distinction between landscape architectural design and architectural design is actually not as different. Um, and the opportunities that projects like this that start to kind of think more bottom up, you know, that's something that never really gets um, explored within, or at least in my experience, within landscape architecture. And so, you know, really excited about the potential of thinking about you know, exterior elements in the same way that, you know, the kind of modular and more systems approach that these projects start to engage with them. Um, so I, it's, it's exciting to see that kind of blending of the interior and exterior worlds, because I think, you know, that's where a lot of the richness is in terms of productivity, but also just spatially, I think, 
a lot of people like to be outside. So I think that's you know the compelling part about so many of these projects is is really kind of uh, finding that uh, blend between between those you know fields really. So appreciate um, all the work that y'all did this semester, and it's exciting to see the projects. Yeah, um, actually, I really appreciate for how to say um, this explorative uh, spirit that you really have in this studio in particular, because uh, you work it, it, uh, from since from the research stage uh, that you present today till the point that you try to integrate what you get from your research and put it back into your design and try to uh, propose something that is quite concrete proposal afterwards. So I see all the efforts that um, all you guys that put it in each single design. So really, uh, I think you already know how much you can learn from all of this process. Um, just, I think, this is a unique occasion because um, after the school period, you won't be able to have such an explorative moment like this that much. So I think it's, it's great that um, the skills still serve for this kind of activities and this kind of initiatives that you allow you to explore, um, not just uh, about architecture itself, but even how you can balance the program with the relationship between um, architecture and landscape and then the ecosystem in general or the environment that you try to be somehow an active agent um, for the current condition that we have nowadays. So really, um, it's a, a brave um, a, and very... Um, I really admire uh, all of the efforts that you have put. So thank you for such great work that you have presented to us. And yeah, of course, I think you would have a good time with the next project and probably with some open questions that we left today with you. So nothing mm -hmm. is about personal criticism, but it's just about to think a little bit and achieve what you really have in your head when you start out with this project. Yeah. Last in the room to thank again for exciting experience. I think that for me, the studio uh, carries a double connotation because it is a studio that asks you to focus very much on the process rather than just on the kind of goal driven results. And that is, you know, in our architectural education, still very much the case. Always just think about, you know, final del deliverables and never question the process. So I think that is very interesting how the studio then also ask for that in, for architecture in, in itself, right? And in our real world. And we saw today, uh, you know, a variety of visions and proposals and real, uh, real serious considerations. How can we shift the the mindset in our you know in existing cycles and our thinking about the things um and our um you know urban commons and how can we um share the you know the agencies across those urban commons so i think that it's really like a, a very beautiful plethora of um of considerations and propositions and i hope that it will nurture your yeah, your future projects and your career, so to say. So we can actually expect that the shifts in the cycles happens already with your generation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for very nice, interesting comments, for interesting insights, opening the opportunities uh, around and being uh, from university point in this laboratory, like I hope that each of us takes something from today's part. And architecture is always like a beautiful discipline to combine these whole entities, but we need to respond also, as, as you have mentioned, to our fields. And uh, I am very thankful for our um, guests. 
also joining from so far away and within different cycle of the time issue and having so many hours of difference. I think uh, not you have 12 hours difference comparing to Austin, <laughs> so it's the opposite. The cycle of the sun is already in the opposite direction of the world. <laughs> it's, it's really nice to meet you at this point, at this minute here, and Indra as well is in a very late evening from Europe joining us here. So thank you so much for participating, for being with us, for listening, for um, advising us to explore, extend, and uh, to notice every detail and moment of importance uh, how to collaborate to those fields. I thank you for everyone for having your own expertise, being able for us to learn from you, like we, we are learning from you. And uh, I would like to say goodbye to our guests and who wants please continue to our next session, which is happening at 1 o'clock 30 today in Austin time. So, um, Thank you very much. And for all students being on time and prepared to present every presentation, we see each other after the break. And from some of you, I say goodbye. So, goodbye. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> goodbye.
Yeah. Hello, everyone. We would like to start our second session of our final presentation. Welcome, everyone. Uh, hello, students. Hello, Indre and Jordi joining us from Europe. <laughs> uh, I would like to introduce our guests today. Our new guests. Um, Jordi Vivaldi is joining us from Vienna and architecture, uh, architect and philosopher. So recently, please join us. Everybody can join. So Jordi Vivaldi is a, a, a writer, philosopher, and the architect theorist. Uh, based in Vienna, he has received his PhD in Institute of Urban Design at, in Austria, Innsbruck University, as well as at, at the moment uh, uh, working on his PhD in philosophy, supervised by Graham Hahn. Um, we are very happy, uh, Jordi, to have you here. With your very wide expertise, so diverse dynamics in your research fields, um, we uh, we are glad to have you from Vienna. We, uh, as well, joins us from UT University, Suhan Katal, a lecturer from UT. Uh, very nice to have you, Suhan, an expert in digital architecture. Have studied in the uh, Architectural Association School in London. It's, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. And we have a Daniel Buspo, Associate Professor from UT, uh, a researcher uh, specialized in, in the area of building information modeling within her previous research uh, based uh, related to the urban design and also having uh, practice in, in architecture and being innovative uh, researcher here at UT. Uh, welcome everyone. It's very nice to meet you. And I would like shortly to all of you to present our studio brief. Let me share the screen. So I hope you can see the screen. Uh, we see uh, it, the screen in our room, and I hope you can see it on Zoom. Our advanced design studio uh, in this fall, uh, we call it planting urban cycles. We're researching on new models of cohabitation for Austin. In order to meet the Paris Agreement, uh, we fought to look at the ways how how the architecture could respond to it, not from the our perspective, but from the architecture perspective. Specifically, we took Austin for this laboratory of that research, how to reduce carbon footprint, which in terms of Austin in 2013. It should have been reduced, it should be reduced eight times less than current stage. It's a big challenge for us with our studio brief. The time is ticking. We don't have that much time left for. So the our studio we questioning is different types of opportunities. Uh, how can actually um, the issues of environmental issues reducing carbon uh, dioxide issues could come through the interactions, programmatic interaction and um, increasing the density, within the increasing the density in Austin. We see density and the diversity uh, as the ma main issues which we took uh, this semester, how uh, diverse communities could benefit from each other, how programs can benefit and use each other resources at the same time would create communal opportunities such as new lifestyles 
new lifestyles we see as a walkable distances in reaching those resources, making them livable, uh, human participation, animal participation, and plants, gardens, and greenery. We looked at some projects for our research part in the first parts of the semester, a project we planned in Chicago, which is recently combining these, these issues, searching for new little small business models for local communities, what could be local produced, zero energy could be uh, prevented by that way. Such as brewery is using a progress uh, storing uh, exploring like additional energy for producing energy with it that way, storing the gas and experimenting at the, uh, uh, using the uh, parts of it for food production, use it for algae laboratories and uh, for further investigation uh, uh, related to the food production. Also looking in the, various ways um, for, for us for as the future how actually also existing elements such as in a city can be turned into our entities we look as, a, as well to the farm in ogden which is combining the model of um, communal assets in in the way of having the cycling such as the water which is food production such as fishes, um, uh, food production as vegetables, locally produced uh, food is accessible to the communities in affordable price and a good quality fresh, fresh vegetables. Cooking together as a communal uh, event, learning to, to cook healthy food, getting new job opportunities here and to have a uh, additional um, perspective in a cycle, how those communities and the technology innovation can be. We also looked in a post-COVID positive effects such as in Singapore, where the roof farming was established immediately where a huge amount of people, residents needed the food uh, and within a struggle of import and export, uh, localized food elements were implemented as a vertical gardening, which we see also a potential to reduce the heat and have less cooling underneath. Those three-dimensional models we extracted and we saw it through the densification, those opportunities, uh, how the clustering effects could be emerge, emerging in our project, how the functional resource communities resilient, adapt over the time. So we, we had several stages in our semester. And the first one, uh, we analyzed those existing models and students created their own models within in the group work. We had research by design experiments where we saw interaction as an impression, the spatial architectural themes within the uh, interaction between the building elements gave us the, uh, the inspiration how those interactions could be livable and viable. We also experimented with a, a certain infrastructural strategies, how this could be more three-dimensional to see so that those multiple ways of opportunities to have programs benefit from each other in the lifestyle, in the density uh, wise would be possible. And the third part, it, as we see it here, like, uh, experimenting means for us to search beyond the house in itself the various in-between situations which of course would give us a benefit to uh, to see beyond the housing in itself the outer space where the communities people machines and animals gardens can gather beyond living just the inside we have that additional in-betweens in our experiments our site, for the site we chose to locate um, in terms of future planning in Austin to expand the train lines, 
uh, every student chose its own spot uh, as a station. We see those open areas, we see them as an open, as an opportunity to plant. You see our buildings, how we could plant them as a devices for new cycle vision. So I would like to stop my, my talk and I would like to invite first student to share the to share the presentation within our first project in the second uh, session. Ina, would you like to come here? Um, Can you remind us this is the camera block right now? Yes. It's an advanced design studio. Okay. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Nina. Um, the project is called uh, The Life of Lucky, uh, and it's uh, basically a co living and aquaponics farm uh, here in Austria. Um, so, I'm going to start with a few uh, case studies here. Um, so, in this case study, the garden tower, um, it was interesting to see. Uh, in this small scale method of growing herbs by having a core element that feeds the exterior vertical layers of plants. Um, in here, this cylinder um, right here contains uh, soil and uh, soil worms that um, um, feed um, uh, and travel through the soil and nourish it. Um, the next case study is the Echo Boulevard uh, that again has this uh, Wrapping greenery element, which defines a public space and creates a cooler microclimate inside of it. And the last case study is the farm in Ogden, um, where aquaponic systems are applied to sustain indoor farming um, of edible vegetables. Um, the aquaponics is basically a closed loop system that uses fish byproducts to fertilize the water where plants grow uh, without the need for soil. Um, and some uh, initial cycle exploration um, includes base elements, which are aquaponics and bamboo. In this large scale diagram, I've tried to draw as many connections as possible between those elements and later on choosing integral parts of this diagram to pursue in my project. Uh, so this is the zoomed in part of the cycle and it includes products that derive from having an aquaponics system and bamboo farm on site. Uh, so I imagine that the fish used for aquaponics can be consumed both um, as food and as used as te in textile production, using the fish skins as an alternative to animal leather. Okay, uh, the next step was putting those cycle parts in relation to each other and figuring out the amount of produce uh, I was hoping to achieve by converting uh, bamboo and fish farms into measured volumes that putting them in relation to a single uh, residential unit. Okay. Um, then multiplying those quantities. Sorry, I think I have the last one slide. It's okay. Um, the next step um, was putting those cycle parts in relation to each other uh, and multiplying those quantities by 100 to get a sense of large scale um, facilities. Um, this is the catalog of parts, uh, an initial catalog of parts, showing the main elements to later on form um, mutual connections. And the spatial cycles that show the relations um, before stacked in a very initial way and enriched with additional programmatic elements that affect communal, environmental and economic aspects. Um, these are some 2D explorations of the shale and octagon spatial configurations um, using different operations to explore the possible ways to combine and overlay these two elements. So the, the base one is here, shale and octagon, 
and everything around it are the possible variations of those two uh, forms. Um, these are selected Unity animations uh, that help me to generate compositions uh, based on a pre designed module. Um, and I'm going to just let it run for a bit. Um, I basically use Unity to um, to show like or to explore different uh, voids or different solids, depending on how you look at it. And then I basically froze some moments and used this composition as a spatial uh, configuration to use later on. Um, the first study model uh, right here in blue um, is departing from my uh, Unity exploration. Uh, with the shell and octagon. Um, so this is a combination of uh, three basic geometries uh, that are stacked. So each geometry uh, is in different color and they are um, stacked, rotated uh, together, shifted um, and arrayed in space. Uh, so that's the uh, model right there. And, um, and departing yeah, so this was uh, basically kind of a 3D expression of the Unity um, uh, explorations. And moving forward to the project, uh, this is uh, the site, the chosen site. Uh, it's in Southeast Austin Riverside area uh, on the intersection of East Riverside Drive and South Pleasant Valley Road. Currently has retail amenities, including fast food joint and car wash and car park store. Um, so after my unity explorations, I began to look closer on the parts for the project. And I came up with this part that serves as a backbone for the rest of the composition on site. Uh, it's essentially a breakout space layout composed from uh, some of the catalog of parts I showed earlier. And this breakout space is essentially the integral part of the proposal. Uh, it includes the um, aquaponic uh, farming plot uh, right here on those uh, levels. Um, and the irrigation pipes that lead to the fish pools uh, beneath, below. Uh, the pipes combine with the navigation system and are embedded within the railing component. Um, this is a view of a communal swimming pool from inside the project, and uh, this is a view of the approach to the breakout space as mentioned earlier. Um, this shows the insertion of the composition into the onto the site uh, in plan, uh, and this is uh, the initial massing looking from uh, different directions. A bird's eye view of the project uh, showing the vertical, horizontal, and tilted greenery elements um, that are that are accumulated to form this porous configuration, allowing light to penetrate in various angles and levels. Um, street level exterior layer, uh, street level and the exterior layer of the building has um, all the public slash commercial uses. And as you go inwards, there are uh, the residential and communal specific areas. Um, talking about the carbon footprint for a bit, um, the slide, this slide shows the sequencing of water throughout the built element, circulating between aquaponic crops, um, inserted leisure pools down to the fish pool and back up, having a strategic overlaps with the navigation system. Um, in addition, moving this large mass of water through the site contributes to the reduction of carbon footprint uh, by recycling the irrigation water, uh, using it for cooling and for heating um, and general uh, energy generation. Um, the greenery. So the green spaces are inserted both vertically and horizontally in the form of living walls, aquaponic outdoor forms, interior courtyards and sunken gardens. Um, these will contribute to the biodiversity of the site, inviting and nourishing small animals. Um, the live wall passages will have a natural ventilation with purified air and result with shading provided um, 
by the law, by the community. Combined with the residential and commercial spaces, the amount and versatility of these spaces turns into a living condition um, where you're always surrounded by greenery and aware of the water usage on site. Okay, sorry, I'm there. Um, okay, uh, section shows the vertical, horizontal, and diagonal placement of greenery interwoven into the shared spaces. Um, Having planted elements merge from outside into the inside and vice versa, cause the blurring line between the two uh, definitions. And the plan, so again, again, the array of vertical garden is based on the shell and octagon principle. This plan view has the placement um, of the components on site and shows the multiple, multiplied vertical gardens unit and connecting each unit to another um, while maintaining a continuous water flow uh, between the gardens and the fish farm pool on the ground level. Um, essentially, the fish pool, um, both of the fish pools, are the pivot point of the compost program, serving as the heart of the living complex, draining and circulating the water. And um, some program uh, diagrams uh, showing here. Um, the private areas, this is, I did mention, it's the third floor uh, plan. So um, the private areas here are the communal areas and the public uh, areas. And um, in, in the dashed red, right here is the proposed uh, station, uh, train station location, and uh, the water uh, distribution on that floor. And the model, uh, so in parallel to the 2D explorations, I've worked on an actual model trying to achieve, uh, again, porosity uh, using the same modula of breakout spaces, uh, three printed, uh, which is then repeated, connected, and inserted uh, in different ways. So just a few um, snapshots of the model. Um, that's what I have. Thank you for presentation. Should I go? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe someone would like to start. If it's a comment. Your guests, if your guests want to respond, somebody. I can start. <laughs> um. Yeah, um, you know, thank you very much for presentation and my eyes are just enjoying so much what I see now on the on the screen because in this very two dimensional world of uh, distance learning to see the physical models is very revealing. And very beautiful. Um, yeah, I think that you I had a pleasure to see your project already like in the pre finals. So I, I, you know, I'm, I could uh, enjoy very much how you pushed towards the end of the semester now. And yeah, big applause. You have not just structured the presentation beautifully, but I think your graphics are very sensible, sensible. And with this sensibility, I see the spatial sensibility. And I would like to actually um, point that out because I was, uh, I'm, you know, I was already looking at the first session and I've seen a lot of beautiful proposals, but I think the fact that you work uh, already somehow in the middle of the term with these physical models, I think that gave you additional quality of really understanding the proportions of the spaces between your, you know, between different elements. And I think that it's very, uh, very, very well balanced in that way. Um, so yeah, this is like from my side, like a lot of compliments. What I like to hear a bit more and what it becomes like uh, very visible in the physical model is the, the differentiation within the volumes. So you, you, you created, um, so to say, the transitions between the, you know, uh, different zones or different uh, layers of private, uh, communal or public. And somehow I could not, maybe it was very short, it would be interesting if you talk a bit about a bit more 
how do you relate these transitions between when the one height of the space and the opening of the big space to like your you know to the functional scheme and to different layers that that you know shift join and repeat um, in this composition of different let's say um, entities of the community so mm -hmm. how do you yeah how do you relate uh, the the volume and the space with the let's say with the fun functional layout one more time if you could extrapolate the so the the circulation part uh i think it's what led me to to say like okay the circulation part would be definitely a communal part and the circulation the stairs leads you into this breakout space which is also shared uh between several um uh, private spaces or private apartments and um so i guess i guess that's the the beginning of it the the navigation plus breakout spaces and then all the rest of the uh built um volumes um and within the volume itself like you have you know like you have one slab, uh, floor height that kind of opens up in this in this you know open end so to say how do you think in that so that actually can be a communal area, um, mm -hmm. also because it's like a, it's a generous uh, uh, height. Um, mm -hmm. Also because it is located underneath the aquaponics, so it could be also um, a communal uh, element. Um, in the model, I I base myself on the communal part. I guess that the next step would be adding the private. Uh, volumes attaching them um, and it's kind of like I like it's very clear for me exactly where they're going to be the kind of the, like will continue uh, from the uh, from the joint areas um, yeah I think the reason why I wanted to better understand it because I think that there is potential uh, in this uh, composition that you have to correlate and co uh, communicate your project to the environment to the, its context in the city even stronger because i feel like there is the you create some sort of you know eyes or some sort of things like these these facades that kind of keep on repeating in different ways but i think it's very beautiful moment that could be yet explored because we talk a lot about these projects like as you know uh, self-sustained cycles and then it is the power of it, you know, that you create this, uh, you know, coherent um, world inside. And I'm wondering now when I see your project, somehow, you know, how does it communicate to outside? What kind of messages those, you know, self-sustained worlds um, give to the rest of Austin? And like, even with the idea of the station that you already, you know, sort of brought in closer towards your project, there is also potential to create a certain way, you know, interfaces almost with these public spaces that then can bridge the gap between the existing, so to say, city and your project. So this is just like some kind of, you know, speculation how I how I interpret the project. And yeah, I think it's very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, from my from my side, uh, I, I also I agree that it's a it's a great uh, it's a great project. So congratulations for that. Uh, I think first of all, it's very well uh, the way you explain it. No, it's very clear. What are you aiming for, right? So you start uh, after the references, you start explaining us um, which is your grammar. Somehow you explain us which are the cycles that you have detected and that you want somehow to. To resonate with, and then you explain us which is your dictionary or which is your vocabulary, right? Which are all these different catalog of parts, no? And then by by joining one with the other one, you start detecting uh, special opportunities and lines of light that you that you aim at at um, exploring, no? So I think that this uh, special exploration is also quite uh, successful. I particularly enjoyed the. The section. I think that the section, particularly the the west elevation and and these these documents, I think are are very rich volumetrically speaking. I think they have a, a lot of special uh, richness that um, 
uh, probably uh, this is here in this document, no? so probably this is spatial richness that you have here uh, could be even more uh, used for greenery. No? So it, uh, depending on the kind of proportion of the empty space that you have, uh, you could deploy uh, different types of, of species. No, but um, no, of course, it's a, it's, it's a great project. And then some, let's say, lines of flights that uh, you could explore in in, in the future that could somehow be deployed from, from the project that you're presenting us. Um, one of them is um, the way you instrumentalize um, nature or the greenery or the water. I think here you could be uh, probably way more aggressive. No? So now it seems that you are very polite, let's say, and you occupy in a very uh, domesticated manner, let's say, um, the, the spaces that, that you have. And, and I think that if you start really emphasizing more the spaces that and, and the opportunities that the different species give you, probably um, this uh, connection in between the building and nature would not be that um, separated. Let's say these two categories would not be that neatly separated, but uh, there would be a way more effervescent uh, kind of uh, natural uh, forces being applied uh, here than the ones that you have today. No? So for that would be interesting as well to have some metrics of which has the production in terms of energy, in terms of food, in terms of uh, uh, items or whatever you are producing here that could also help you to understand, okay, which is the potential that uh, my space is offering and where I am now and also how this uh, nature is changing during the the year and also all that are, of course, you probably had no time to explore all that, but there are just different lines of flights. Probably since I see this section, uh, the underground space could be also way uh, more explored here. You have uh, more opportunities. Um, and finally, probably is not part of the, of the brief, but um, these also questions the way how do we manage all this production? No? So is this the opportunity for um, understanding our production as a sort of cooperative. It's a cooperative, what is uh, happening here. It's the same place where you uh, produce food, you sell it somewhere else, you consume it at the same place. No, So there is probably a, an, an opportunity for deploying here an economical model, which is not um, necessarily the one that uh, we have today. No. So yeah, besides that, uh, yeah, congratulations. I think it's a, it's a, it's a great proposal. I think that it's also it's a strong drawing, the, the section, but I think also that the strength is also its weakness. It's strong because, I mean, it could be raised the section for existing building. And, and I think the, the weakness is that everything what, what you introduce conceptually doesn't uh, appear here in a way formally. For example, like, let's start with fishes. Uh, so yeah, um, what happens actually when you lift up a fish tank really, in, in height, but also what are the proportions of those fish tanks? Um, they now like those, those kind of uh, shawl, you know, like this, this kind of slabs. So why, why, you, uh, like, why they have those proportions? Because of course it's like a modernistic thickness, which is dependent on the daylight penetration into a, 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 a volume. You know? So the, the depth in a way of that is uh, determined by like that you get from both sides in a way you have some depth of, of daylight. Yeah? And then that's the, like the, the kind of common kind of proportions of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you take into this kind of like now uh, all kind of different non-human posthuman whatever like kind of procedures for space making, it's also you can use that for really teasing out different proportions which then and in, in those kind of spatial dimensions. And then I, I, would, I would guess when, when you think more into this kind of materials of those slabs, something where you don't inhabit them, it means you inhabit it just in between spaces, which is for me now at the moment a bit too open, a bit too much maybe not the cooperative, but more the cooperative kind of building form, the way you have a bit like landscaping on the, on the roof, so you make a Kind of, yeah, you make a complex building form, but actually, it's in between spaces are not really used mostly. No? And this is exactly where you see the synergies for, for the building. They say, hey, like the, the building, or as Jordi is telling, the building itself is an expression of a, 
of an economic of a kind of livable body. So like when, when people begin to work and live together, so that it itself begins again like the building becomes a body of a community. So then you want also those kind of like like pretty interstitials and so on begin to use and connect this also to a different form, not only like a human community, but exactly this kind of like connecting to uh, like not the fish itself, but like it's very interesting that actually the whole building is actually full of water. Right? Yeah. But it's uh, it, yeah, again like to like what you said with the, the, the models. It's, it's so good that you that you could be seeing models. So like, I like it a lot. Thank you. Thank you guys for the, the comments. And I just want to continue maybe the conversation about the focus that would be necessary in this case on the post construction phase of this life of water and plant that we do have to consider maintenance as part of what we do and how we design. And I would have maybe considered the integration of robotics to maintain, like we talked about in the seminar, that you could not only have um, every, you know, the new diagonal, I mean, the diagonal system is novel. What you're introducing is very different from either the horizontal or vertical living system, but to have diagonals is really interesting. But all of these are at a scale that is urban and would need almost an army of people to maintain this. And so that's where I would think to default to technology and things that are advancing right now into part of your proposal, because you even bring up the pit of parts. That's as easy as sort of plugging in one of those little robots or the one that maintains it as one of your objects in the kit of parts. So I think that that's something that you could easily add and not have to dive too deep into, but would definitely complement what you're saying. And I completely agree with what Daniels just pointed out about this section is that we, we have the notations of greenery in those different um, orientations. I particularly love the diagonal, but I want to know what that does for us. Like as an element of living system, slope automatically means you're collecting and you're draining into something. Yeah, we would see a big body of water underneath every slope and that that is with equity to the green part of your section mm -hmm. and so those two things operating together is to me what makes your urban proposal successful because the forms are you know as cartesian and orthogonal as can be right so it's the open spaces that are giving advantage to green life and water collection which is what we need so I, um, I again, like others, applaud you, especially for the models that have and have a different way of enticing us, but also yourself to think about the project. So that's really terrific. My last comment would just be the way that your project sits in the site is I'm totally fine with it being autonomous and you thought about it compositionally off site, but when you then plant it on the site, and then treat it more suburban in nature. It's like suddenly it's got the green lawn around it. That's where you need to reconsider what is the urban condition that is reaching your project to the train station. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. I guess the, the those yes. green spaces are unlike uh, in suburbia. They are public, so they are um, to be. They are the periphery of the urban to be used. Yeah. Right, but it's still green long. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think I'll let it repeat again, but a different voice. <laughs> I think going back to the site, and it'll be more like your project is about top of the water. That's what you want to see. It's more the water nature. That's so how you move the water around. I love the fact that you get up the water moving around, but I always you pause it, continue up that conversation about the ponds because that's like, which is the right slope, like you understand the slope of what is. How do you cause a rush and make your water moves? It's a bit more, what is the right slope too? So my clients would say, be a little more aggressive on your face and certain amount of fun. I think also when you're doing this kit of parts, when you're activating it and making all the operations you're making it, there is a bit close to that ablation because some of your vineyards are now underneath a shadow space and you know, like you have to make the judgment. 
to say maybe it's not a great, it's not a stair where you just see that your foot. So don't take, I think, what you're getting from your screen or your from community to say literally this is what it's going to be. You can post it as a political process. Like, for example, the cause, right? I think that is in addition, maybe that's to intent. Then maybe the component goes at a higher level, then it all comes down, and that is what the structure is, and not just as I call it, it's that it's a structure. So it would have been a close evaluation from the case that sits a world, I guess. Those are all right? This is just like an initial idea. Yeah. 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 Sure, I'll just make a quick comment. I didn't see your presentation, but just reflecting on the two images I saw, uh, and knowing a little bit about Ross's project here. Uh, I think what's really interesting about your project is you, you began with parts, and those parts have different characteristics to them. But as soon as you get to the section, there's a translation that Subhash is talking about where the parts actually start to, because they are cohesive, some of them are cohesive, some of them start to aggregate in a certain way, they actually lose the part of it and become masses within this larger whole. They become their new, new parts, parts that are joining pieces together. And so you lose a bit of the identity of the original parts into something that I think transcends just the accumulation of bits, which is really hard to do because in bottom-up projects, you reveal patterns, you reveal fields, you reveal thing agents, swarms, but they still retain some kind of part hood to them. But to actually create a kind of top-down massing from a bottom-up strategy of part making is a, is a tricky thing to do. And so I'd be really curious to see if you took this translation now back into the parts, like make a model of this one, how that might reconfigure or recombine some of those pieces as you assemble it, because you're going to find connectivities. They weren't part of the original units that you made. And, and within those features that start to join and create you know, anomalies within the project, those are like really interesting moments to, I think, connect to some of these ideas that you mentioned, but really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. 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 Andreas, we will have the next project. Okay, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see the Look at that. It splits. It splits that. So sometimes it's cool, but then when you go to the special, you get the two or three of them. Yeah. It's really cool. Hello, my name is Andres. Uh, my project is called Modular Interstices. And these are a couple of the case studies and key precedents that I looked at. Uh, one of them is the Bosque de Vertucale in Milan. And here uh, I was really interested in how the uh, projections uh, from the building created the, the area for greenery. And uh, this other uh, product is a hydroponic micro farm uh, that can produce uh, the equivalent of uh, 2,000 square feet of outdoor farmland a year. Uh, in uh, microgreens and leafy greens. And starting with the research analysis, looking at quantities um, and the relationship between outdoor and indoor production and uh, living area, um, I started looking at uh, for outdoor production of summer and winter crops. So uh, during the summer, outdoor production uh, produce uh, Maybe something like uh, legumes that pair with a uh, winter crop, like a flax 
the, the flax plant. I chose the flax plant because I also wanted to consider a plant that could yield something other than food. Um, but after investigating that, I found that the amount of uh, plant product that it takes to yield uh, actual woven products is, is quite massive. And, uh, that land is much better served for uh, maybe a, a flax seed variety of plant that produces a, an edible product. Uh, so looking at these quantities, um, I found that uh, there was roughly uh, enough to produce um, the daily intake um, uh, using calories as the counter, uh, the daily intake uh, for two people uh, and of, of their diet, of the daily diet. And I also found the same relationship for uh, one of these uh, hydroponic micro farms, uh, as well produces enough for uh, two people of their daily calorie intake. Uh, so that that comes with the caveat that uh, you know using that same metric of calorie intake, you know the production from those areas would only account for maybe about ten percent of a two thousand calorie diet. So it's still kind of short of being uh, completely uh, self-sustaining in terms of food production, but um, I think it offers uh, several other advantages that I'll get into later. Um, so. This set up that relationship of you know living area for four people uh, creates a, a ratio of, of one unit of living area to two units of outdoor farm or two units of, of um, indoor micro farm uh, with a bit of surplus uh, for certain products. In this case, it's a surplus of flax seed. And so, is that about? And so uh, setting up this proportion, um, uh, here is just a, a simple stacking of you know, what, what that would look like in terms of, of uh, 3D proportions. So this is taking that same stacking and analyzing other parts of the cycle that could be incorporated uh, into the program, uh, programmatic environmental and uh, you know, aspects. Um, but at the end of the day, I really ended up focusing on that food production component. So this is again, taking that same food production ratio and now uh, trying to explode it a little bit. Um, so uh, considering access to sunlight and daylight. Uh, then from there, we moved on to uh, studies of architectural themes. Um, this one is on Palat and Cloche, and I'm going to set the video while I talk. Um, uh, based on these logics set up in Unity, um, I was attempting to create uh, moments of on and moments of Cloche, and you know, moments when it's transitioning from one to the other. Um, and I think this also captures uh, sort of that space in between the, the masses um, and how that can take on either that on the way or push it. So this other architectural study uh, is with Labyrinth and Shale. I'll go ahead and get the animation started. So uh, same idea as I was describing previously of uh, Attempting to uh, animate how the 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 movement can create moments of labyrinth and, and shale and a transition in between. So from there, uh, circled back to that sort of two to one ratio um, that I've been looking at before, and just. Uh, began to look at how you know that could be implemented in a in a massing for a building. Uh, this is using uh, shifting, and this is using rotating. Uh, just using some basic modules, and uh, I came up with this 
conglomeration of groups that uh, have also been uh, uh, regulated to fit the boundaries of the chosen site. Okay. Allow these to shift and rotate uh, with each other uh, with an intent to uh, create these densities and these voids uh, for the massing. So this is the chosen site. Uh, Ina and I have the same project site. We chose uh, this lot on Pleasant Valley in East Riverside next to proposed uh, Blue Line Rail Station. Uh, there's largely multifamily, a uh, low-rise multifamily around this area, so that seemed appropriate uh, in terms of our, our intervention. And this site also uh, offers a pretty significant slope from the north to the southwest, it uh, slopes up 50 feet. So that created another opportunity for intervention as well. There's an aerial shot of that site with a car wash and an auto parts store. You know, this is probably on the verge of being a brownfield site, considering the, the dedication to automotive. So that was something else that was important to us. So this is a bird's eye view of the proposal. Uh, the, the building steps away towards the north to allow more opportunity for uh, direct and indirect sunlight to reach uh, into the depths of the building. Um, it, it attempts to, to balance uh, lighting for both uh, planting and for people. And, um, because the slight is sloping uh, away towards the north, the building is, is tapering in both directions, uh, vertically both up and down, uh, which also helps it to relate to the low rise multifamily housing to the south in terms of scale. So, this is a catalog of parts um, that's actually intended to be uh, prefabricated CLT uh, modules uh, with uh, some living modules uh, that can be grouped together to create. Uh, either one, two, or, or three bedroom apartments, and then some grow modules uh, where you can have a, a cluster of hydroponic micro farms in, in the dark areas. Um, you can have a, an outdoor grow module for uh, horizontal gardens and a, a grow module for vertical gardens. So, this is how. These different modules were uh, grouped together uh, in the Unity study to come up with the uh, proposed massing. Um, and this maintains that ratio of uh, two outdoor units to uh, one indoor living unit uh, that, that was established at the beginning, with the bonus of some vertical green space and uh, extra hydroponic micro farms in the dark areas that don't have access to use the daylight. So here talking a little bit about the, the quantities that were achieved, um, the potential to impact carbon footprint and just sort of the overall cycle of things. Uh, on a ground level site of roughly 280,000 square feet, uh, Achieved roughly 238,000 square feet of dwelling, um, and it achieved roughly 125,000 square feet of vertical green and about the same area of horizontal green. Uh, so, uh, this exact proposal fell a little short of the two to one ratio, even though that's where we started. And, um, but I think it could be. It sets up a good uh, framework uh, and a good starting point that could be further optimized to, to, to increase uh, that, that production. Uh, there is a generous amount of ground space that I, I didn't count towards um, towards uh, food production, so that could be useful food production as well uh, to get us closer to that goal. Uh, but the indoor micro farms are the the dark space that that was created. You know, those are by far outperforming 
tell what's needed. And um, so there's, there's a plethora of that. Uh, but the idea here is to represent that by, by taking things like pre-production pre uh, out of rural areas and into urban areas for freeing up land for reforestation um, and carbon capture and that material. And then uh, harvesting those trees now to store that carbon in um, less timber buildings, creating a, a cycle. So this is an area plan of the building, uh, creating a series of uh, labyrinth and shale and uh, courtyards uh, in between the building massings and uh, trying to maximize access to uh, sunlight and daylight for both people and plants. There's a, an actual metric uh, from the east. And that's really just setting up this view for the section to show how the site slopes down from the south to the north and uh, how those dark spaces are created in between the, the different modules. Um, so here we're going to highlight the different types of program that are located in the building. So these are the areas of horizontal gardens uh, that would be dedicated to residents and allocated to the roof. Uh, these are all the vertical gardens that are created for the residents uh, that occur both on the roof and on uh, private balconies. Uh, every living unit would have a private balcony and access to the roof. And then these are those uh, grow modules for the micro farms uh, in places where that have needed, uh, that don't have access to uh, sunlight for use. So these are all of the living modules. Uh, there's about 700, but uh, one module is about uh, 350 square feet. So you need to combine them uh, to create uh, so these are rooftop modules. Uh, the roof is really dedicated to the res the residents of the community as sort of an open space. And so uh, this is a communal uh, covered outdoor space that lets out onto the horizontal roof gardens and, and vertical gardens uh, for the residents to use. This is navigation for residents. So it's elevated off of the ground planes, giving their, their sense of community and privacy. Um, there's a series of vertical uh, circulation cores along with circulation on the rooftop. And that's separated from the sort of public communal domain uh, that's allocated to the ground floor and the ground floor units, um, which would then connect to the, the train station across the street. So here's a perspective uh, from the south to the north. Showing how areas kind of pull away to uh, create these courtyards and avenues to allow for uh, sunlight, access to sunlight and daylight. Uh, here's a perspective uh, looking, staying on the roof, looking up one of those uh, avenues. Um, the, the modules are, are stacked on top of each other, the CO, prefabricated CLT modules, and then they're shifted uh, in and out to create opportunities for uh, those private outdoor balconies that uh, are then uh, covered on one side with a sort of vertical garden wall, provided uh, somewhat of a screen uh, that's protecting the game. So this is on the top or close to the top looking down uh, at some of those horizontal garden areas on the roof. And this is an actual measure close up uh, further depicting the relationship of uh, navigation on the roof to horizontal green area, vertical green area uh, that's located on the roof and on the balconies, and uh, the relationship between 
uh, to sunlight and daylight for both for plants and people. And that's my last slide. Thank you, Andreas. Can I just ask Andreas, do you imagine, have you imagined how these are configured by the users? Like you said, you would have to buy three of the modules or do you imagine that someone could buy five or that they could buy two instead or that they could buy one? Like, is there a sort of user customization uh, strategy that you'd consider? Uh, I think there could be because, you know, these are all prefabricated. So, right. um, so they are uh, basically just programs um, and they can be pretty easily customized. I would imagine to, to meet the needs. But you've not gone to that next level of, say, composing them together. Yeah, I've just shown maybe three different options right here. But uh, yeah, I mean, they could they could go on on and on. Um, and I, I haven't I haven't gone to that level. Of detail. Okay. That's a it's a great great project because. I like really the technical ones, so it's it's super realistic, and it's I like me like at first. Uh, in, I, I mean, I know, know the project from from the pre files and but it, at first, like always the the messing, you know, you could say, hey, now that you're school, like you can uh, try to do or to express more. And now, I'm like when I see that we worked out, I'm super glad that we didn't do this. That it's like really a project which could be now built there, but it's so much more because like you add now, you add the, the mass timber as, but not as a kind of research the mass timber, but really taking on like exactly the, the, the fabrication cycle and showing, uh, understanding the project now in, in, in that kind of resolution also of, uh, of, of parts. So you see it as, a, as an ecology directly. So these these drawings are super good that you you show it directly as a as a as a field of them. So so you can explain also it's not only about this one flat module and but uh, actually what, what comes actually then uh, when you see it more the technical drawings more at the urban scale in a way when, when you show because you have then in a plural condition what actually then in a way emerges. And I, I understand that, I mean, like it's a three months project, that this is exactly now that it starts to get interesting. And that's like, like when you, there's so many different layers, like also when you say, hey, I have uh, on the ground level, I have the, this turns into kind of shops or something. So to up on a, on a, on a roof, which has a, a very modernist, very classical understanding of a, of a roof ground. Or like a kind of communal or like again like providing uh, kind of recreational gardens or so so like it adds like step and step by this like like ways to that and yeah and then of course like what there's this one drawing which i missed and this is your second site it's the the the, the idea that your building produces another site complete distance to the building this is genius Yeah, I, um, I was actually, there's you know, something else I'm interested in is uh, the fact that this is on a, on a rail line and, you know, how could that rail line potentially connect the, the urban environment to that outside site, you know, like you're talking about, um, and how it, maybe it just doesn't move people, but it also moves product, like maybe. You know, maybe that's how these modules get to the site is by the same way that, that the people people move. Um, but yeah, I feel like that's a whole nother study uh, to, to look into. I mean, they don't have to be literally connected, I think, inside. Right. So that you, 
I mean, it's a very ecological thinking right, that you are conscious about that those activities you know, in the place, of course, impact from the distant places. So and that you now say now actively say, hey, that I'm actually with my activities here with my residential units or like living, I'm also designing something outside of, of the city, right? the classical hinterlands or the rural. And this is this is super intriguing because exactly that's now missing. Uh, that in a way we, we begin to not only take this into account, but this actually needs design. This needs actually where the forethought should go into it. It shows so hard to do something. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think this project has so much potential in what it what it could hold in reality <laughs> for um, our and for Austin, especially with the lines that are being set up. I love the density and I love that you can maximize greenery everywhere. I really think that although it's Put on as sort of a wallpaper consideration or just a green curtain. I would like for you to then take it to the next step of resolution so that we see with a bit more detail and intention what that could really be. I, I totally understand the abstraction of, of the green right now, but for me, I just would like to see um, zoomed into a cluster of these units with the kind of customization that is possible, which is why I was asking that question. And with the reality of what could be planted here, because you've thought about everything, I think with really um, rigorous intention. And so that's where the thicknesses of your green roots is appropriate. And so you could potentially grow many, many things and you've paid attention to light. So I wanna see how that's being brought into a unit and that the unit itself is something that's so viable. And uh, I think that that's where I would encourage you to take this next. Yeah, I think my comments are kind of the same. The project has like a lot of potential to keep going and rethinking. And what I like about your presentation, especially what I like about it's like you were critical to yourself saying I did not have the space enough. So ground level from your potential. That is like something I encourage you to continue. It's like why is not working on the center is not working and so say it could be this the potential. So going back to that ground space, like your roof, it's articulated to the roof, but in the ground space now it's like the pathways and all that stuff, right? It's not just a gritty surface. And that the liquid articulation will start off in this. Also, you step down into the scope, right? If you more steps, it creates more opportunity for green space because when you step down, you have another extra vertical surface that can increase that number. You just try to find ways of how to increase that number of gap. And the ground level is where you have the potential to step this up and down, up and down, and put this on. Yeah, the project looks pretty good, pretty realistic that it can be built. Yeah. Thank you. Some hash brings up an important part of the process is that it's so quantification driven and it hasn't dried up into just something. Uh, but now, and so I think that that's really um, commendable with you adhering to what's necessary, and maybe that quantification research was prompted by the brief. But I really think that you digested what um, the user, uh, two users, would need for one day of food, and uh, the way that that has uh, allowed you to generate this amount of density, and then seemingly complex project, I think it's really, really nice to see. I would like to um, build up on my, like my comment around the time uh, topic. I think it was addressed in already several ways and I think it's very serious project. So it's very interesting to think, um, you know, how you build up the project from uh, considering the cycles before it's it's architectural form so you you have this whole strategy you know of fabrication and, and module and i'm asking myself you know how this project then evolves after it is what we see on the screen and i think that for me is a part which is still unexplored in this project so again, I, I, I really agree with, you know, all the compliments to um, expressed already about, about your work. It's extremely well 
you know, done. It's a, it's amazing resolution to work to see on the screen. But I'm wondering now, you know, uh, if we have it, is this kind of idea of time that is you know needed and all the resources that we come to this stage of project, what happens later on? You know, how that idea of connecting to urban environment in urban environments to, to the rest of the world, you know, that, that you expressed as your interest and ambition, how does it happen after this project is built? And that is also an issue when we consider that you work in the project with modules, you know, man-made matter and the living matter, because you basically integrate within your models already, you know, also the living matter. And I think that is very interesting, you know, problem that you you pose here. And I think that that could be yet explored a bit better or like a bit further in the project. Of course, considering the, you know, the time and all the, you know, um, efforts that you put, it's, uh, it's amazing what we see. But I feel that there's something unexplored in this project. And I would really encourage you to, to think, you know, about how the actual, um, you know, weather uh, patterns, how the quotidian and annual cycles would, would change your project. And somehow while looking still on what we see on the screen, I, I recalled um, the reference. It's, it's a hotel, I think, built by Jeffrey Bava in, in uh, Sri Lanka, which is basically in the tropical kind of environment completely taken over by the greenery. You know, this whole structure is completely like sort of, you know, immersed in that and I'm, I'm wondering you know what would be happening with your project let's say in five or ten years yeah thank you for a beautiful presentation yeah so also very thank you very much for your presentation uh, a couple of comments because many things have been uh, already said so I, I i particularly enjoyed the this kind of three ecologies that somehow you are overlapping right so you were speaking about uh, kind of programmatic, environmental, and, and communal colleges, no? And to have all of them mm, taken into account together and, and overlapping, uh, I think is, a, is, of course, a great decision, especially to understand which are the transversal lines, no? That somehow are crossing and traversing all these um, different, different layers, no? Something that uh, a couple of points I, I also really enjoyed of the project, one of them is the diversity of urban conditions that you produce, no? So there are some moments that, that it, it seems that you are in a kind of, uh, kind of village or that you have a house or a single house or even a parrot house, and then other moments uh, within the same continuum almost, right? In which uh, you have various floors, no? So that for sure generates different urban conditions, different manners of using the, the public or semi-public space, which I think could be could also be explored. I also enjoyed the way uh, you present the navigations, no? in which there are some moments in which you seem that you slide through the, through the ground or through the floor and other moments in which you jump through the stairs. No? So this kind of um, jumping from one to the other one, I think, can, can provide a lot of uh, richness in terms of circulation. No? I think here you have uh, another opportunity. And a couple or three of uh, elements that I that could be somehow explored uh, in the in the future. Uh, one of them for me, Crashel, is how do you arrive to the ground? No, so it's a project that seems that tries to emerge from the ground. Um, it would be interesting to see which sort of continuities do you establish with that, and the parts that are a cut uh, a cut off from the rest of the of the city, how do you manage this uh, landing of the building on the ground, on the sidewalk, no? which now is treated more or less the same in, in the different parts. Um, you play a lot formally with the granularity of the facade, right? which is a continuous zigzag. Uh, I'm not sure, well, I don't know, probably this zigzag is since you are, um, let's say, multiplying the amount of facade, probably some moments they you could play with this range, no, of more or less zigzag, some moments in which it's absolutely linear, and some moments in which there is more zigzag, uh, which probably generate different uh, climatic conditions since you need uh, more or less uh, meters of, 
of uh, facade. No? And finally, it's, it's interesting to see in, 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 in this project, but also in others, no? in which we can see how uh, the building itself is, is or, the, or the block, it's pretty much modularized. Yeah? And so the construction is made out of uh, prefabrication and modules that are repeated, uh, while nature keeps being understood as a sort of continuum, right, that uh, is deployed over the over this kind of discrete uh, combination of pieces, no. So I I just wonder was wondering what would happen if if you would also somehow uh, modularize as well the organic substance that you are uh, dealing with, no. So it seems that you are modularizing so much the the inorganic substance, let's say, the perforated modules, and we keep treating nature as this sort of underlying continuum of of uh, forces, right? And, and, and probably there would be some possibilities if we also kind of discretize no, this nature and we treat it in, in terms of quantities uh, as well. But anyways, I think it's a, it's a great uh, project. So congratulations for that. I need to, to read lesson of the uh, project now. Like, I could go, of course, the next step further and say, to ask like where's the parking? I mean, so thought when you when you compare it with the context, so like this this bird view image like from the existing context, like it's it's of course the the existing or like I mean it's, it's really scary the, the how how actually housing gets deployed in, in Texas. I mean, see, actually there's more footprint area for cars than for people on that side. And, and of course, you can achieve that density because you, you expect them. It's like a very simple move by ignoring. You, you can actually then uh, have, have that density. So would it be then, uh, is that part of the or is it like that you say, uh, you, because it has the public transport con the connection, that I'm saying, hey, you can't just enter, like uh, you can't just live there or move in without a car. Or signing him off like this is uh, is famous in, in Switzerland. They have uh, living communities. They are not allowed to have a car. Like it's, 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 a, it's a quite 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 great move. So is it in that realm and, and so on? So that's actually quite nice that you draw such a complexity on this kind of realism that you can actually now uh, I think would be also next step. I, I think always in Texas, like it, it stays and falls of, of course, like with the, with the car question. They're finding really an alternative uh, with, with the housing. What actually happens? Uh, what we do actually with those, those car spaces? Or we can change them? Or like, is it generally what was the self driving cars or not? Like all those, those, those questions which come in the field, there is something again which is movable, which like, Special forms of organization, which are will be certainly will be remodeled in the in the near future, and yeah, like the, the, this, I think that your project like gets them all like yeah, step the next next step from the practical to the Yeah, I think to, to I completely agree with what Daniel's saying. Like you can't really be neutral to what this could cause and what it should mean for you and your design process. So challenging the automobile in Texas is a you know tough one. Um, but I think given that you're next to a train station and that you could potentially live in this village, as Jordy said, um, it, it then brings up the, the notion that the housing can be an impetus for having people live in a place that they don't have a car, they can sign on, that they're not going to need a parking space, and that potentially you provide more for them than just the habitation and the ability to grow their own food, but they can work there. They don't have to commute 25 miles away to get to where they need to go. They can potentially transfer those modules into their own workspace, um, work from home even. I just think that you could push it to that next level. And that's not to devalue what you've done and that you ha haven't done enough. It's a very complete project, but I just, I think we see the potential of it being something where your own portfolio can be pushed a little bit further uh, as a, a, a serious conversation piece. I think a simple diagram is just showing how much surface parking is on this side and you can go to the neighbors at the bottom of that parking spot that 
tells you you don't have a part in this case. Like there's more surface parking action. Well, yeah, I think converting modules from this to more like a mixed use mm -hmm. also helps you know, improve that ratio spark. I mean, in this case, we'd be reducing the amount of people that actually live there, but that that actually is better for, I guess, the relationship between the amount of food that can be produced and the people Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's that's this, exactly what Daniel meant. You have chosen quite central location. Yes, very close to the center, but the image of the current stage. It will very soon change. So mm -hmm. it's amazing to see the the options we create. Yes, one is a train, but I'm sure there will be more lines, more public transport, more opportunities. And a current station looks like a suburbia that is very central in Austin. Thank you very much um, for comments and for students presenting. We have one more project. I would like to invite you to share her screen. How are you two? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Great. Can, can everyone see my screen okay? It needs a bit of time, I think, too. Let's wait a bit. It's still black, but it shows has started, uh, has started screen sharing. So maybe it appears soon. Could you try again? Share your screen. Sorry, it showed that my Zoom quit unexpectedly, but I'm going to try to share it again. Can everyone see my screen OK? You can see it very well. Thank you. Okay. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tu Boy and I'm a landscape architecture graduate student. So for this design studio, we spend the semester researching about the urban cycle, exploring different spatial configurations and how they interact with each other. For the last half of the semester, we branch out from group work to work individual on our design. Um, even though we have different program and element um, different part in our design. Our end goals here is to design a self-sustained community here in Austin. So without further ado, I would like to present to you my project. It's called Urban Green. So before jumping into the design process, we spent some time researching on different case study that help us better understand how having access to green space and nature have a positive impact on our physical, mental, and emotional health. So for the first case study is a preschool in Newport Beach, California. Here you can see how exposing children to nature at a young age can be beneficial to their education and their healthy diet decision later in life. So next 
is the atrium at Henry Ford Hospital in West Bloomfield, Michigan. Many studies have shown that having access to green space can really help speed up the patient recovering process, as well as to reduce the amount um, intake of pain medicine. Okay, and the last case study show the home farm project in Singapore designed by Spark Architect. This community is, a, is mainly for elderly people and the goal here is to allow people um, access to healthy food by having urban farming right at their home. Another thing that I would like to point out is that this really encouraged senior to be more active, which will improve their physical health. health. Um, and then this next slide is about the planting cycle. So we will start off with the rainwater runoff. It is a big issue in most urban areas. By having green space and public park can really help um, slow down and reduce the amount of water runoff. And um, as we already know, having access to green space it's also very beneficial to the uh, to human at like all age range. Um, and next one I want to point out, talk and talk about the oyster farm. So on, on average, an oyster can filter up to 50 gallon of water per day. So um, we can then use this water to water our farm and to use it in our aeroponic garden. So aeroponic garden is a new way of farming to, due to its minimal water requirement, as well as how little space it will take up, uh, which space in the urban area could be very uh, valuable. Um, and then um, aeroponic got towel, towers can produce many vegetables like tomatoes, um, lettuce, herbs, wheat, coffee bean, soybean, as well as tea leaf. And I also want to talk about the benefit of chicken farm in urban area. We can use the egg um, for bakery shops as well as for restaurants. Um, so next, uh, I want to go over the anaerobic digester. So for all the leftover food waste can, uh, can be tr uh, transformed into renewable energy using the anaerobic digester. Okay, so uh, moving on, I wanna go over our finding from the different spatial configuration study. So here is the interaction between Enfilet and Poche. As I go through this research, I thought that Enfilet is a great way to apply to vertical green wall and Poche is for human living area. So that way everyone will have access to green space from all sides of their home. And the next interaction we have is between shell and labyrinth. Um, the green represent public green space with individual residential units surrounding it. This way, everyone will have access to green space within close proximity to their home, which encourage a more walkable community. So the location I picked for my site is at the intersection between North Lamar and Airport Boulevard. As you can see, this is also a location. It's like one of the stop station for the um, Project Connect uh, in the future. So here's a closer look of the site. The total area is close to 450,000 square feet. And here's a simple site plan. Uh, within the area. So the site plan show the building footprint. Um, 
right here in this shape. And the plaza area, which is hatch and connected to the existing train station right here. Um, I also included a bridge which could be which would need to uh, further develop to gain access to all four corners of this intersection. Okay. So for my catalog of parts, I have greenhouse um, to greenhouse for for times in the year where um, the weather could be had a harsh on plan. So uh, people within the community have a, not an alternative options of how they can plan their crops year round. And cisterns is to, um, to store uh, water, rainwater and filter water and aerobic digester. And I also have the aeroponic tower, raised planter, um, chicken coops, as well as green wall. So here's the spatial layout. So, sorry. So this shows the residential um, unit. So these will be private area. Um, and then this is a view from the balcony at one of the unit. Um, so here's the view of the balcony at each residential unit. Even though this is a multifamily apartment, uh, private outdoor space can be created by using different um, by using different element of vertical green wall for screening to create privacy within each unit. Um, and this is the view of the balcony looking out to the train station. So even though it's in a pretty close proximity to the train station, um, having different layer of vertical green can really help filter out the air um, as well as to reduce the noise pollution. Okay. Next are, is like a quick diagram of all the shared space. Um, and within the shared space, um, I propose it would be nice to have the aeroponic tower and chair area that is also sandwiched within each residential unit um, to allow walkability and if air filtering within the area. So, um, and next is a uh, chicken farm could be incorporated in share space as well. Um, here is the view of the market square. It can also be referred to as plaza. So in this area, it's um, mostly on the lower level where most restaurant, bakery, um, more of a commercial um activity will be happening here at the plaza. And um, this area can also be used as a space for local trading of fresh produce or can just be used for like a public gathering place. Okay, here is the com combination diagram uh, between the private and public area. Um, next, I would like to talk about navigation. So this is private access for each uh, residential unit here in the teal color. Um, to take in a closer look at it, I will take out all the uh, private area just to show the access space. So here you can see um, even though they are layering on top of each other, it, it's all connecting using um, the staircase 
that can be embedded within each uh, of these overlapping uh, private access. And here's the rendering to show uh, the intention and my thought process on the private access space here. And then next, I want to go over uh, a more access, um, share access space within the community here. Um, so let me go to the next slide. This show are uh, the, the RAM that's connected uh, between share spaces. Okay, here's another look at a closer look of the RAM. Um, as you can see, I also included uh, steel cable and have vine proposing to have vine growing on them to create a another layer of green, which will be very beneficial to both human and the environment. Here is a diagram showing both the private and share access space. Um, um, so to, um, to separate these, so since the, uh, the share access space is kind of cross over the private area, um, by having like another layer of green planter between those two can really uh, create a more pleasant view looking out from your balcony. So to divide between private and access, uh, private and share access space, uh, I encourage to use um, gates that need to be uh, that can only be accessed by the resident who live there, as well as to use um, also vertical fencing um, as well. So it's really helped creating like a, a separate route for both the public and for the resident who live here. Okay, next I want to talk about the environmental benefit. Um, here are three different green elements. Um, so the darkest green is gonna be the rooftop garden, which will help um, with water runoff and air filtration, filtering. Um, and a lighter shade of green shows um, the patio screening for each resident unit. And lastly, it's more of like a darker, um, say more a grayish green is to show the vertical green elements. So um, here is a view from the rooftop. You can see the rooftop will be um, private to, uh, to be used by resident only. Um, so on here, you can see can, uh, I think it's a good place to include the, the greenhouse up here as well. Here is a look of the patio screening. So you can see um, different type, different variety of vertical green has been embedded um, to help with uh, noise pollution and air pollution as well. Okay, so this section um, can, this is a section cut through one of the unit here. So you can see um, share space are kind of embedded between each of the, um, the uh, private spaces and also different layering of green over here at the train station and uh, plaza area down here. And here is a, uh, a 
combination of all the different programmatic. And to recap, this is a uh, bird eye view of how this community will be fit into the existing uh, site. And so our hope is to create a more sustainable community in the urban area like Austin to help reduce the carbon footprint. And that's conclude my final presentation for this urban planning advanced design studio. And I would really appreciate if you have any question or comment. Thank you. Thank you, Chu. Chu, that as you invited the questions, maybe you can extra extrapolate a bit and you had a very interesting starting with uh, looking at different groups of people, like also ages, you know, like you talked about preschool, about the hospital reference and about the elderly people. How does your project, did you build up or inter, um, somehow continue on exploring how these different groups of um, ages and people are, you know, unfolding within your project in these communities? Um. Okay, that's a great question. So here from this view, you can see the individual resident um, unit, but they are different sizes. So it could be for the senior and also for single family living so that uh, the senior won't feel like lonely because they will have interaction with the children from like neighbor children. So it's like different um, age range could be living in this community. And two, when you say is that, that you want actually to have uh, interaction between these different groups, wouldn't you then make your outside outdoor terraces or seating areas on the same level as your kind of crossing areas. I mean, now you separate, not between, as I understand, it's like a mezzanine type, where on one level you have your balconies with your plants and then your sofa, grill, or whatever, yeah, like your, your outdoor area for your flat, and another, like you're just crossing and walking. So, how, how you would now further stimulate, like actually, this kind of interaction? But wouldn't I now not try that people meet literally more often all that time? Also, in terms of we spoke, this was the last uh, kind of projects came the question of time in architecture. That you also consider your project, that, that part of the formal project is like this kind of time, like what different times or that different probabilities. So that can is also a kind of and then map this into different types of, of people, or like different ages, different, like different habitats, that could also in a way stimulate and have different kind of using patterns or so. And then try them and then those discretize and let's say like a terrace and a corridor that in a way are mobile, I think is more. And this I thought always like, I mean, the nice thing on a circle is that the circle is the most inviting form because it encloses, but it's also the most kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's just like a defense. Huh? Also, you can, depending on your, if you read it as a convex or concave kind of form huh, from the interior or exterior, it's, it's quite the opposite. So it's actually just purely as a formal diagram, the, the, the circle or where you begin to connect those they're good in a way like for, for making a courtyard or making like a, a world entity. And, and I follow was like when you began to explain the urban form that it's somehow you want to do that both at the same time. Not bringing people in or with this bridge and so on, but also in a way having like a calm residence area and so on. And, and I would just wish that that could, of course, like be more more complex, or like instead of like just having this, like a like an S shape, 
that in a way you vary it over the different levels, or that just like when you have the close up renderings, it looks always as one circle would meet another one. Or something like that. So actually, more these kind of different terraces be good to merge, and because of those, you get now different situations. I mean, from the kind of render quality or this kind of. This, uh, of course, I, I understand you. You, know, you have a landscape background, so it's very, very good in this uh, kind of expressing a, a landscape uh, elements. Uh, and and this, like, I, I would wish that this moment in a way ripple back into the kind of like of overall housing form or the urban form yeah thank you i have to connect to daniel's comment because this is uh, my uh, observation also and concern you know that i really see the sensibility in this like delicacy and silly ground moments when you talk about, you know, the moment of, of like different vegetation in relationship to the building, but I feel like you were not bold maybe enough or, or even trusting enough, even this discovery of different, you know, um, components of communities and, and allowing that to really interrogate your bigger form. I feel like it's not, you know, doing enough for the bigger form. So I really trust your project when you, you know, you come to close ups. And then I, I feel like, you know, that didn't really do much for, for the overall, uh, like this S shape. And this is a bit of like now when I, I saw the being brought together in the end, it's a bit like also started to really distance itself almost from the entire, you know, context setup of the, of the of the Austin uh, city, even though you kind of diagrammatically, you know, have these intentions that there is a connection through the possible bridge and so on. But I think that would be really strong if, um, you know, these gestures that you do, let's say on a smaller scale would allow you to one more time run over a big, through this bigger urban form and uh, allow stronger differentiate, spatially stronger differentiate what you call now patio, you know, uh, green roofs and, and, and the vertical ones. So basically, you know, like giving it like a bolder go. Yeah, mm -hmm. so maybe I stop here. Thank you for presentation. Thank you. Yeah, connecting, connecting here as well. Um, thank you uh, also for the for the presentation, I think it has a kind of potential. For me, the strategy is quite clear in the sense that you say, well, I have a building that is a big, uh, solid uh, a mass, and then I surround the building by all this kind of mechano of uh, greenery that operates at a complete different scale, right? And all this somehow for you is underpinned in this idea that you at the very beginning you explain us, which is the psychological benefits of of nature, no. So probably uh, grounded on this, on this formal, let's say, a strategy and and on this discovery of the psychological benefits of nature for different ages and for different forms of uh, community. Uh, the point probably is to how can you stress even more uh, all these kind of uh, corridors and stairs and terraces that you have, where I think this world lies. Uh, the power is probably to start seeing how can you cross these specialities with that what you need for the psychological benefits of, of nature. No? So I think that probably um, going a bit further in this direction could be could be for sure uh, helpful. So anyways, uh, thank you for your for your work and, and your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I think I also. Um, think that we do have a certain sensibility toward uh, the landscape elements in the project, but that we could be pushing them to potentially code where they're being used and why. You know, for instance, you have these very tall creepers on the trellising elements, but the same trellising element or a version of that is being used to then subdivide the shared balcony space along the residential unit, I feel like you could be a bit more distinct with the differences between how the, the green elements, the living systems are operating. And I do agree with Daniel's comment about the communal 
aspect of the separation of wars and that you're to me missing an opportunity with this redundancy of ramping everywhere not to use that in a more activated community way you know as Indri said you brought up the demographic of elderly people and health and so many people in Austin have to go to an indoor shopping mall to do their walking because there are no sidewalks but you created like the endless sidewalk project and or it could be you know so I think that you um you could be using the ramps and the connecting pathways as more of like a real element that's wide enough for two people to walk next to each other that serves as this exercise mechanism around the project and that those are the parts that are then covered with your green living system it feels as though you've got balcony railings that are missed opportunities for how again you code or signify what uh, the living system could be doing and how it's operating, you know, trellising versus modular. Uh, so I just think that you've got the start of something interesting, um, but maybe the, at the scale of detail is where I would expect you're, could, you could be more specific. Um, I'm not interested in the formal project that this S shape produces. So I would have to reconsider that because in your presentation, it felt like a big jump for me when you went from the pushing and pulling of those two uh, crochet and infiltrate, I believe you said, elements that sort of, you know, danced around each other. And then suddenly we had an S shape. So to, it was a big jump and I didn't understand the, the step in that process. But it was, um, I think you got the start of a really nice project. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to follow up a little bit of that, too. Like the unity interaction you made, that was a lot more interesting than going to the next year. How we got there was the big question. We're all asking, like, how we got to this geometry so quick. Because the unity, there were some moments where this was intersecting, some this was not intersecting, there were voice, there were a lot of different things that were interesting. And it's good that you're not taking that result literally and converting it to architecture. That's fantastic, but this one's way too good of a job of now. I, you're controlling everything. You control the shape, you don't understand how you got there. And then the process ends up being like a singular thing where let's add stairs, then let's add ramp, let's all add it to the outside. Where in the unit, there's interaction that we were looking for. Like your beginning of the presentation was really good of understanding age group, program, and all these different concepts. But I think the later process, like you should have brought a little bit of that again to where the interaction happens. If I take a graph, can I meet someone that takes a stair every day? You know, like those moments are key that you're getting from you. It feels like then you sort of like just populating our own this S shape. And that shape was so crucial that it cannot change. And it would be nice if they started changing it. But I think the way you present the project and your intent, it's very strong. Like these are really good programs to talk about and how you work it on. Thank you. Thank you for comments. Thank you too for sharing with us so much images, perspectives, um, speaking to your cycle. Thank you for everyone giving us very extensive thoughts to rethink our processes to come back and uh, and look at it and get more impression for the further steps in our career, in our education, in our research. So uh, that is very, very valid for us from each of, the, of, of our guests and the guest reviewers. We have learned a lot. I would like to ask if there is something if there is something you would like to give a word or the overview in general about our studio if some of you have some some word about it you could please express it now before we would uh, end up our session um, well, for me I, i'm really pleased to see that your brief is pushing them to not only consider 
the need and design for housing. I think that that's really critical um, currently, and but that it's it's also having this integration of living systems and just the environment in general that you're really having them focus on that and that comes through and makes their projects so rich and so they're they're um, starting from a very good place I think because the brief has been written as such so congratulations yeah I think the brief is super key to the group it's almost very good there I really like the last one. Like, I really like the students' talents of uh, one of approach and this non coming to geometry that I picked. But then I think as a student, you also have to go back to the middle age. I think it was good to see a little bit of difference in the last project from the two with the, with the unity and the state of community. But I think it's interesting to see these two, these two approaches to see how much we can go to this. I wanted to use the chance to thank for invitation, of course, and congratulations to, yeah, the entire studio. I think that's that uh, impressive body of work to engage in such a challenging brief is uh, is fantastic. I think that every student uh, learned a lot, but I I believe that we also, you know, um, so to say, juries and teachers can learn a lot um, through your visions. Because these visions are um, something that we are asked to deliver as architects in our days, and to think uh, once again in every generation, you know what co co what makes up our living environment and how it comes into being. I think it's a, it's you know it's never exhaustible question. So it's fantastic to see how you entangled, like in the process of designing, you know something that we kind of keep kept separately for a while, this, this relationship between cultural and natural processes. And I think that it would be really, really fantastic to keep on exploring uh, during these studies because it's more than ever crucial. And I think that if I remember well, your, your brief even started with this ambition of, uh, you know, 2030 um, UN uh, 17 uh, sustainability goals. And it just shows the, the, the gravity of this brief that you were presented. So congratulations to Rasa and thank you very much for having me tonight. Yeah, thank you also from my side for inviting me and having me and, and congratulations to the, to the students and to the, and to the faculty. I, I particularly enjoyed how you managed to overlap uh, these three layers that I think that they are recursive in all the projects. No? So you pay attention to the environment, you pay attention to the community, you pay attention to the, to the program. No? So you have always these kind of three ecologies uh, that then you, you manage somehow, they, they inform your design no? in a very, in some cases, in a very clear and, and well-elaborated manner. Also, there is always um, a, a, a very strong spatial richness uh, you, the projects are always well measured, well proportioned, well placed, uh, well contextualized. No, so the size is appropriate, the scale is appropriate, the, the grain of the project is appropriate. So, uh, I think that it's important to not uh, somehow forget these other ingredients from any work of uh, architecture. Despite, of course, you put a lot of emphasis in this other kind of um, ecologies. And finally, also appreciate how close the projects are to being built somehow, no? In the sense that they they look that they could be built uh, without uh, having, let's say, to do big, uh, or without having big problems or without having to do a huge effort in terms of speculation, no? So it's very close to, to reality, which I think that this is uh, also quite important. So anyways, uh, congratulations uh, again, and, and thanks for, for inviting me. Yeah, I mean, um, maybe they continue on, on Jordi's comment. It, it's really surprising that uh, it was, I mean, I remember like the discussion was Russell, it was set up as a more kind of looking at this kind of intersection between this kind of all research agenda, all this kind of discussion on really like an ecological form from a more technical perspective. 
what comes in with the circular economy and so on those. And actually, like in the college form, they say like we are conformist form form from architectural design. Right? And and that's surprising now that's actually they're quite realistic the, the building, so that it was quite quickly imaginable to get this actual bridge in those. It, it's clear also this I think is more like uh, what I see, what I learned from that studio is when you work or we reach the complexity, which we want again to take on as architects, which I think this I see for a lot of stu studios that you see like going away from uh, just the material experiment or like that any kind of, I mean like experimentation, architectural design experimentation. And I also, of course, like uh, you see it in a worked out phase. So like you sometimes critique or also catch myself, I like, critique that, hey, there's drawing missing. I don't know, the plan doesn't work really. And I know and the research is not really research research. Of course, you can't do this alone. You can't do this in three months. So this, I think, uh, generally maybe is like more or less in the faculty, how we can actually more productively draw this over the years or over the studios or like also for you students. Like really, uh, this of course is a longer time, longer term research or longer term kind of design process. No? Like that's, I, I don't think it starts, it's not anymore a studio which like you get a brief and a challenge and you master that and then maybe the, the, the master student or in a way gets proved on a program but you're really like an active member into developing something which we need now then we know that we can't educate anymore for a world which is just a given thing and and the construction industry which should just continue to work how it works but how we actually now like give you or like developing actively with you actually a future. So that's a bit like I think what's also underlying that kind of working or teaching or not research led teaching. It's like really kicking you on the way or giving you this push like hey it's up to you further on like just taking all these trajectories. Now you can continue those actually to really yeah like making a change. Yo uh Thank you all for, for sharing your work and for working in that agenda. It's like this, this, I always learn a lot in these studios. And yeah, thank you, Massa, and thank you to all the, the students. Yeah. Yes, and uh, thank you. It's, it's nice to hear the comments and the insights. I also would like to say to students some good work from me that. Uh, I'm very happy about one point, what happened in our studio that maybe differently to something we used in architecture, we had a specific program, like not setting up with uh, searching, experimenting with looking into different uh, areas, you gather the knowledge and you develop, um, even we could say something could be more established some area has more potential, but you made very original aspects of programs. And uh, each of you have very individual, different approach to this cycle in a way a balance of seeing architectural output and maybe missing something there, but also balancing in the cycle and missing something there, which is normal. But I'm really happy to see each individual of you uh, being so global within that specific aspect and expressing it and trusting it, not to be, get lead on given and program that is the score and so that is the program, which maybe would limit us. So I see, I, I really compliment each of you to be so diverse within these experiments, to let yourself in the experiment sometime and to use also our realistic approaches from the perspective views to try to experiment and to understand the scale where maybe we sometimes fail, but to understand how the green area and human, how these two relationships can correspond and carbon footprint, what amount of issues, like let me say sometimes it's missing, sometimes it's more could be explored, but I'm happy to in, in anyhow in multiple ways to see your approaches within this program, each of you being original 
uh, within your different backgrounds. We had from interior design, from the landscape, from architecture program, diverse students uh, completing uh, your interesting insights to the cycle. Thank you so much. I'd like to say to everyone, very good words to wish very nice afternoon and very good sleep for the, the guests joining us from Europe in a very, very late night. We appreciate very much you being there. And uh, we wish you then good rest, good night, and the students as well, good rest. Yes, goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.